morning. I hope everybody has voted today or has a plan to vote. And if you haven't, it's a reminder that there is an election happening today. This is not the most exciting thing of the day. Maybe, maybe, maybe tied for first. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, I just want to quickly acknowledge that we're he joined here today by uh, a committee member and, and my colleague, uh, Council Member Aliki, Alika Amphrey Samuel. Uh, Councilmember Daniel Danny Drum and Councilmember Richards. Both Councilmember Drum and Richards have bills that are before the committee today, and we'll all offer them an opportunity in a moment to uh, say a quick word. Um, if, if you are here, if you are uh, here, you should be here for the chair, the committee on criminal justice, on the hearing on programming. And I want to acknowledge that we have a number of folks who are downstairs who are still coming, a number of providers and other folks who want to attend the hearing. So we'll be making room for them here and looking for space for them as well. But we'll start moving ahead in the meantime. So thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Keith Powers. I'm the chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I want to welcome everybody to this hearing focusing on Department of Corrections programming. Um, as we, many of us know, the programming really has the power to transform lives and impact those who are in custody uh, in our city jails. By addressing the needs of incarcerated people, the programs can help improve behavior before and after release from custody, which in turn can reduce uh, misconduct in the correctional facilities, increase post-release post employment opportunities, and re reduce recidivism. Given the importance of the program, this hearing gives us a cru of programming. This hearing gives us a crucial opportunity to learn more about the programs offered at correctional facilities here in New York City. Uh, the, D the DOC has a commitment, as is required by law, to offer at least five hours of programming per day to incarcerated individuals and to give them information about available programs upon a mission to DOC custody. However, today we want to find out more information. We want, we want to know uh, whether either of these requirements are being met. And we want to have more data to sufficiently measure the efficacy of programs offered in DOC facilities. In the DOC Department's most recent report on correctional programming, information on volunteer-led programs was absent, and information on successful completion of many programs was listed as not available. Program providers have also raised concerns surrounding clearance and training. Temporary clearances often go missing once volunteer providers arrive at DOC facilities to conduct programming as such clearances are maintained and communicated via fax. As a result, incarcerated persons miss out on a days of programming. Uh, volunteer providers have also expressed concern that the content of the training, which features videos of violent assaults conducted outside of DOC facilities, dissuades volunteers from program providing program. Um, with, with alongside that hearing, we're also hearing two bills today Introduction number 261, a bill by Councilmember Richards, which requires DOC to conduct a survey related to the quality of life of incarcerated persons. We also are hearing introduction number 1184, a bill by Councilmember Drum, which would require DOC to maintain a library offering general interest books to incarcerated individuals in New York City jails. I want to note and just say thank you as well to the providers, but also the Department of Corrections for uh, we had a roundtable last week to discuss some of these issues. They attended to help hear from directly from some of the providers about the issues facing them. So I want to thank them for uh, their commitment before this to help start addressing those issues. And we look forward to their continued partnership in trying to resolve some of the issues that have been raised and to continue to find out more information about the efficiency and the effectiveness of the programs being offered. I want to thank my staff for helping to put together this hearing. And with that being said, I want to hand it over to the two members who have bills before us today, starting with Councilmember Drum to speak about his bill. Thank you very much, Chair Powers. I'm a firm believer in the power of books to transform lives, and nowhere is that more evident than in our jails and prisons. History is replete with instances where access to books made a difference in turning away individuals from crime and toward productive ends. A voracious reader during his period of incarceration, Malcolm X referred to books as his alma mater and urged individuals in and out of prison to read absolutely everything you get your hands on because you'll never know where, you, where you'll get an idea from. In 2017, New York State announced that it would effectively be restricting, among other things, the books in its, cor in its correctional facilities. The subsequent outcry forced Governor Cuomo to back down. 
Unfortunately, other jurisdictions across the country have pressed forward in their efforts to restrict ac access to books and other written materials. From the advocates, I've already learned about challenges around the Department of Correction publication and provision of Connections, a resource guide for incarcerated individuals written by the New York Public Library. I look forward to getting clarification on this as well as a host of books that should be available to those on the inside who are so hungry for connection with the outside world. As our jails transition from pits of despair to places where people can begin the path to reentry, we must focus on the role of books in this process. Intro 1184 would require the New York City Department of Correction to maintain a library offering general interest books in New York City jails. The department would also be required to report on the number of books it receives, the source of those books, and if those books are censored and the reason for censorship. And I'd also be interested in hearing from the department today on how often access to books and to the library occurs. Thank you, Chair Powers, for holding this hearing, which I hope will shed light on the benefits and challenges of programming, and specifically books in our jails. Thank you, and thank you for your bill here today. I will also hear from Councilmember Donovan Richards, who has another bill on the agenda today. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chair Powers, and thank you, Councilmember Drummond, to all my colleagues. Um, so I'm sponsoring intro uh, 261, which would amend the city charter in relation to requiring DOC to conduct surveys related to uh, the quality of life of people incarcerated. And partly one of the reasons we came up and drafted this bill was uh, last summer I had the opportunity of visiting Rikers. I think some of you might have been there. And, you know, you spoke to a lot of uh, the individuals who were incarcerated, whether they were female or male or whether, wherever we were at in that specific facility. You know, one of the things I heard over and over and over again was the need uh, for better programming, um, you know, more training, an updated law library. And when you spoke to some of those young men, especially uh, where we were at, uh, they were really concerned about their voice not being heard um, within the walls um, uh, where, where they were at. Um, so we wanted to ensure that as a council that we can push uh, DOC to do a better job. I'm not saying you're not trying. I think, you know, we, we specifically went to some locations where I remember a young lady being there and her um, learning culinary arts, I believe. But, I, but there was a big disconnect, I think, within um, the facility we were in when it came to teenagers opposed to um, people who are 21 and older. So we hope that you support this bill. Um, surveys, it's not one of my favorite things to legislate, but I think it gives us an opportunity to gauge data and to hear from those who may feel like they are voiceless, um, who are incarcerated, to really give them an opportunity uh, for their voice to be heard. So um, look forward to working with you and look forward to seeing the results on this bill. And I want to thank you for what you do day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for both of you for your, your bills and for your statements. Um, so now we'll move over to the administration, Department of Corrections testimony. We'll start uh, just by swearing you in. We'll have our council uh, swear you in. Thanks. If everyone could raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Great, thank you. And if you, if, before you start, if you don't mind just introducing yourselves, your names, and your role. Uh, my name is Patrick Dale. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Training and Development at uh, the DOC. Good morning. Deputy Commissioner Michael Chalzik. I am the Deputy Commissioner of Programs and Community Relations. Community and Parks. Good morning, Deputy Chair. Kathleen Davis, Chief Community and Parks. Thank you. Just into the microphone. Thanks. Becky Scott, New York City Department of Correction, Acting Bureau Chief. Great, thank you. So we'll swear you in and then you can be in your testimony. Do you affirm to tell the whole truth, the, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Good morning, Chair Powers and members of the Criminal Justice Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the Department of Corrections approach to programming for those justice involved. My name is Michael Tausick, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Programming and Community Relationships at the New York City Department of Correction. Joining me to my left is Becky Scott, 
Acting Bureau Chief of Facility Operations, who has over 25 years of service with the DOC. And to my right is Deputy Commissioner Patrick Dale, who recently joined the Department and oversees training and development. Today I will briefly walk you through the Department's programming strategy, current reform efforts underway, and our plans for future improvement. I will also comment on intro 261 and intro 1184, the two bills being considered today. First, I'll provide you some background. DOC offers a wide variety of program options that promote the acquisition of life skills, vocational skills, internal growth, and well-being, and assist with successful reentry. The, uh, the department utilizes a number of approaches and programs for those in our care, including but not limited to the designation of program staff to focus on group facilitation, contract providers, individualized reentry planning, tablet-based educational offerings, and workforce development courses. It is our job to ensure that people are better prepared to contribute to their communities on their way out of custody than they were when they came in. We acknowledge the vital role that programming plays in attaining that objective and we do not take that responsibility lightly. The department is dedicated to a programming vision that promotes pro-social behavior and provides individual services targeted to specific needs. For that reason, the programs division offers, offers a vast array of programming that ranges from concrete skill building to supporting behavioral and emotional wellness. Program offerings also play a critical role in the department's violence reduction efforts. Engagement in program reduces idle time, which is critical in eliminating violence and other negative behaviors. The programs division within a DOC has undergone recent structural changes that standardize operational processes. Previously, programming was overseen by two separate divisions within the DOC. One division oversaw programming for the adult population, and another division oversaw programming for individuals 21 years old and younger. Today, with the adolescent population no longer on Rikers Island, the two divisions have combined into one division responsible for the coordination and provision of programming to all individuals in department custody. Provision of services is now incorporated into a single unified structure. Our data collection is more uniform and centralized and our processes for identifying program gaps and program needs are enhanced. By more easily identifying gaps and areas for improvement, we are better able to address individual needs and advocate for sensible housing placements that allow access to more targeted programming. In recent years, with the support from this committee, the city council, and the mayor, and the department has made significant advances in growing its network of program providers, its range of program offerings, and its responsivity to the distinct needs of different populations. While our programming is now structured under one division, we still remain more committed than ever to providing everyone in our custody comprehensive, evidence-based programming based on correctional best practices that address the distinct needs of each population and individual. As a component of the department's commitment to housing young adults in young adult specific housing whenever possible, we're able to provide education and tailored programming accordingly. By developing creative solutions to safely house individuals with a history of violence, we created an opportunity to provide targeted programming designed to, re to disrupt violent behavior and encourage pro-social behavior in its place. Further, we continue to provide and develop gender responsive programming that addresses the unique needs of women and mothers in our custody. Our approach to programming is holistic. We leave no stone unturned and we're always happy to meet with our programming partners to explore ways we can, con we can continuously improve our efforts. Current initiatives. The Programs Division is committed to providing all individuals in custody with individualized programming that addresses core needs, provides opportunities for pro-social skill development, and prepares individuals for successful reentry into their communities. Program services include, but are not limited to, AA, NA, alternatives to violence training, culinary programming, horticulture programs, behavior management, and group counseling, job readiness training, life skills courses, 
parenting courses, literacy assistance, vocational training, and transitional assistance. We also offer engaging programs that provide soft skill training, such as Rikers, Rovers, and Paws, programs in which rescue dogs are cared for and trained by incarcerated persons, helping those participants to develop a greater sense of accountability and responsibility. Similarly, the horticulture program tasks participants with caring for gardens on a facility grounds, providing an opportunity to build soft skills while preparing for reentry into the workforce. Beginning in the spring of 2019, the department will roll out programs, a programs menu that will be given out during the intake process. The programs menu will be tailored to each facility and provide a comprehensive overview of the program and educational opportunities that are available as well as provide information on how to sign up for those offerings. In recent months, the Programs Division has undertaken several reform efforts to improve the department's ability to meet individually's critically important educational, vocational, and therapeutic needs while in custody. In an effort to incentivize positive behavior, the department recently piloted an innovative incentive-based housing structure. This four-tiered pilot affords participants targeted programming and rewards sustained positive behavior with desirable privileges. For example, individuals in the lowest level receive programming that addresses criminogenic thinking and promotes pro-social behavior. As individuals progress through the levels, they attain additional privileges, including access to tablets with educational content and entertainment. Individuals in higher levels who have demonstrated positive behavior gain access to more vocational training and associated cert certifications to help us facilitate outcomes such as meaningful and long-lasting employment upon release from custody. The pilot not only rewards positive behavior, but in doing so, it creates an incentive for otherwise disruptive individuals to pursue constructive engagement with programming that will better prepare them for reentry into the community. The department has also undertaken a number of efforts aimed specifically at improving services for women in custody. Recognizing the unique needs of women in our care, the department recently created and filled the position of Executive Director of Women's Initiatives. This role is tasked with gaining a holistic understanding of the needs of women in department's custody and working with providers to tailor programs that meet their unique needs. Further, the Executive Director of Women's Initiative works with a population to identify and remove barriers to family visitation. The department is proud to partner with the Children's Museum of Manhattan to offer off-island visits for incarcerated mothers who have at least one child under the age of 16. Originally, the Children's Museum visits were only available to sentenced women, but two months ago, we're able to successfully expand the program to detain women as well. This visitation program, which was the first of its kind, is now being replicated by departments across the country. The department also has initiated efforts to improve family engagement, including expanding opportunities for children in foster care to visit their mothers outside of regular visit hours and without going through the regular visitor intake process. In addition to those initiatives, we're very encouraged by our growing partnership with the Department of Education regarding the provision of educational services to individuals in our custody. Through a coordinated effort, DOC and DOE work directly with young people upon admission to DOC custody to encourage involvement in educational services. We recognize the value of focusing efforts on our shared goal of engaging people in education and vocational services. The department will continue to work with DOE and various providers to ensure similar opportunities are expanded and further developed. Further, the department is encouraged by the success of the Jails to Jobs initiative, which is supported in conjunction with MOCJ and offers intentional linkages with ICANN and SMART programs, provides access to employment and educational programs in our facilities and upon individuals return to the community. The ICANN and SMART programs provide reentry planning, support individuals in procuring necessary identification documents, and connect individuals to services once they return to the community. 
by addressing educational, vocational, therapeutic, and other needs in an individualized way, time inside jail can be used productively to lay a foundation that can prevent future interaction with the criminal justice system. These efforts improve lives, make our jail safer and more restorative, and ultimately lead to safer and stronger communities. Further improvements. While the department is encouraged by the success of recent efforts to engage various populations in meaningful programming, we acknowledge that we must address operational challenges and improve service provision to individuals in custody. The department is committed to providing more transparent communications regarding the availability of programming in each facility and housing area. We are currently considering opportunities to advertise programming options, including through the use of newly installed video monitors and in intake areas. We're considering solutions that better capture data pertaining to programming, which will provide us with the information necessary to most effectively roll out new programs and tailor existing program provision across our facilities. We are committed to building partnerships with service providers in order to better capture data regarding service provision and attendance in order to better match programs with distinct populations. We will continue to engage people and seek innovative ways to further increase participation. Additionally, the department will continue to improve and grow its volunteer services. We're always looking for new volunteer partners and encourage anyone interested in volunteering their time or interested in partnering with the department to provide a program to contact the department's Office of Volunteer Services or the Office of Community Partnerships. Contact information for both offices and an application to obtain volunteer clearance are available on our website. We're taking steps to improve the organizational structure of the office to better serve the incarcerated population and the incredible people who selfishly dedicate their time and energy to engaging our population. We celebrate all of our volunteers' initiatives and thank them for their service to our population and to the city. The department is excited by the incredible progress we have made in recent years to grow, develop, and improve our program provision across our 11 operational facilities. As we continue to improve our program provision, we must continue to be responsive to our community partners and the volunteers who dedicate their time towards our shared goal of improving programming provisions and impacting lives. Their input is invaluable to us and we look forward to creating a sustained dialogue moving forward in order to continue engaging our partners. In recent weeks, the department piloted a revised securities training based on the comments we had received from several provider organizations. The updated training focuses on security and situational awareness in a manner more appropriate for civilian staff. We've received positive feedback on a new training and will continue to be responsive to feedback that improves our training courses. In addition, I am proud to announce the department will be creating a pro program provider working group that will meet quarterly. This working group will enable the department to get direct feedback from our programming partners and enable us to react to suggestions and concerns in real time. We'll also be assigning providers with a point of contact in each facility who will assist them in getting escorted to their assigned classroom or housing unit in a timely manner. The department also has been heavily involved in a programming subcommittee as part of the Rikers Implementation Task Force and a Culture Change Working Group. And we look forward to the continued and productive engagement with community-based organizations and program providers. With these partnerships, I am confident that the department will continue to develop innovative solutions and improvements towards the imperative of providing individuals in our custody with the critical educational, vocational, and therapeutic opportunities to improve their lives and our communities upon their reentry. Introduction 261. Intro 261 would require the department to provide all inmates with an annual survey regarding their experiences in city jails. Although we appreciate the goals behind this bill, we believe that this sort of undertaking requires careful planning in order to create methodologically sound survey that it most accurately represents the experiences of those detained in New York City jails. Moreover, in our view, the results of this survey should produce information that can be acted upon. In order to create a survey that produces valuable and useful information, it is critical that the department have reasonable time, of, uh, a reasonable amount of time 
to investigate how to best conceptualize, roll out, compile, and evaluate this type of survey. We are determining what steps are needed to plan, create, and implement this survey and look forward to working with the council as our, discussion, our, as our discussions progress. Introduction 1184. The department believes all individuals in its custody should have access to a wide variety of reading materials. The intellectual engagement that is facilitated by reading cannot be overstated. The department currently contracts with the New York Public Library, Queens Public Library, and the Brooklyn Public Library, which provide library services to all 11 of our DOC facilities. Through these partnerships, individuals in our custody have regular access to books through mobile library services. Our library partners keep their shelves updated on a variety of genres, including new releases, and ensure books are in good condition. These library services are available to inmates weekly or biweekly, depending on the facility. Books and periodicals are available in English and Spanish and additional languages are available upon request. Many of the individuals in our care also have access to electronic tablets, which contain reading materials in addition to educational materials. The Department of Correction is committed to meeting the needs for library access and is open to expanding efforts. The current library partnerships, which bring books directly to inmate housing areas, are working well, and it is unclear how creating dedicated library services would improve access. Mobile libraries and rolling cart book carts offer library services to inmates directly and safely. The department already operates law libraries in each facility and is open to reimagining these spaces as joint library, law library services, but would need to investigate the logistics further. While the department supports the spirit of introduction 1184 and is committed to working with library partners and a council to improve existing library services, we do not believe that this bill would have the desired outcome of actually increasing the level of access to reading materials. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, just hand it over to my two colleagues who have bills here today because I know they have uh, busy schedules today. So I'm going to allow them to ask just a few questions about the bills that you've just you just uh, commented on. So I'll just start with uh, Councilman Richards. If you want to ask a few questions. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, actually, you want to go first because you have a committee. I'll let I'll, I'll cede some of my time. Thank you very much. I'm finance chair, so I have to have a finance meeting after this, and that keeps me pretty busy. But um, Thank you for your coming in and for giving your testimony, and I want to acknowledge some of the efforts that you have made in terms of uh, improving um, programming uh, within Rikers. Um, I think you briefly walked us through a little bit about uh, how library services are delivered basically on carts. Uh, there's no specific room or place that is actually a library, am I right? Uh, thank you for that question, sir. We have three physical libraries throughout our facilities. One is located at MDC, we also have one at Rosie's and one at EMTC. So how does a detainee get access to that, uh, to that library? Uh, through controlled movement. So by housing unit, they would be called down to access that library. And then what, a, a detainee would have to sign up or request to go to the library? That would be s true, sir, yes. And do you track how often um, a detainee um, request is, is granted or followed through upon? Not at this time. That would be part of our progression through our data collection on how to act to how to acquire that information. If a detainee misses a opportunity to go to the library, does he or she have an opportunity to uh, see the cart? Our cart, for instance, in EMTC where we have a library, is um, open to all 28 units. So if an individual in EMTC missed library services in a physical space, they would have an opportunity to um, choose a book off of that cart. If and that's I'm, offered at a different time? Um, housing units receive the cart twice a month, so bi-weekly. Twice a month? Twice a month. How many books are they allowed to take? For that facility, I do not have that information at this time, sir, but I could get that for you. But there is a limit? I would say, yes, there, there would be. I just do not know what that number is. Okay. Uh, can you get us that number? Yes, sir. Okay. What about for those who are in punitive segregation? How do they access library services or books? If 
Punitive segregation is one of those housing units at this time that does not receive the rolling cart library service. So they get no library service at all? Correct, sir. Wow. I mean, imagine being in solitary confinement and not even having access to a book. Sir, if I may add, although the library itself as described here isn't available in punitive seg, they are allowed reading material. So ha if their family member wants to bring an approved reading material, they can access periodicals and publications. But if they don't have way. a family member who wants to bring it, they well, don't have access? Well, if you want to share other inmates that can share reading materials, if the newspapers are delivered daily in every mm -hmm. housing area, <coughs> excuse me, including punitive seg in English and in Spanish, so they have access to the daily newspapers every single day. One newspaper? It's a, a certain amount for each housing area, so it's not just one. There's more than one in English and in Spanish that's available every day. So that's pretty amazing to me, actually, that the DOC does not provide reading uh, to those who are in solitary confinement. I mean, that's probably where you need it the most. How do you pass time if you're sitting in a, you know, 10 by 6, you know, cell um, and not go crazy if you, if you don't have any, at least reading materials? Sir, it's an excellent point. I think as we move forward, that would be part of our vision to expand our library services so we can encompass all housing areas. Um, that includes specialized housing areas, um, our mental observation housing units, uh, punitive segregation. So it is something that is on our radar that we are concerned about to offer every housing unit library services. And I think that's why my legislation is necessary. Um, I just proved it, that not every um, inmate or detainee, I should say, is getting access to books. I mean, this is, that's, that's just a basic thing, to get a book, you know, um, be able to read. It's, that's amazing to me. It's really, it's, it's actually shocking to me. Are there any proactive efforts taken by the DOC to encourage use of the libraries? In our housing units, we have postings of all our mandatory services and services that are offered to that housing unit. Um, it's encouraged by our internal staff, external staff as well, to, in to motivate individuals to read, to, to, to utilize the library services. Um, I was in a housing unit just a few weeks ago, and I'm not, I cannot recall which public library was providing the CART service, um, but I, there were three individuals that had come out of their housing unit to acquire books, and it was great to see. There were affirmations by not only myself, but other staff as well. There was positive engagement with those individuals, so it was a, it was a positive sign. And so a lot of that is done informally uh, by just encouraging everybody to read as much as possible. Are books offered in different languages? Yes, we have them in Spanish as well as English, and also different languages can be asked for on request and then provided to them. And then in the, um, the, the specifically designated library rooms that you have, not the mobile carts, does DOC put in any resources into those libraries? Do you stock those shelves? Do you buy books for those um, libraries? How does that work? Those are stocked by our library partners. By the, by the public library system? Yes, sir. And is that, does that circulate, the, the selections that are in there? or um, they're, they're changed out. I, I'm not quite sure of the frequency of that schedule, but we have uh, current books in there, um, recent releases, and just like any library service in an institution, they're, they're turned over to ensure that there's current books that are, that are accessed. Do you know um, the uh, number of um, uh, books that are available? For the three libraries? In the um, libraries. No, but I could try to get that information. I'm not quite sure if the public libraries also maintain what their inventory is, but I can try to acquire that for you. Okay. Are there any um, publications that are banned? Our policy on incoming publications shall not be censored delayed unless they contain specific instructions on the manufacture or use of dangerous weapons or explosions, plans for escape or other material that may be compromise the safety and security of our facility. That's how our policy is written. Are books offered on LGBT topics? Nothing is prohibited except what's described here, sir. But that's not the answer I was looking for. Are LGBT books included? Yes, unless it contains any of this. Okay, so you have LGBT uh, reading material available. I can give you an example off the top of my head. I cannot, but nothing um, prohibits it from being available, no. Okay. 
Um, are there any individuals who are denied access to libraries? To the library you're describing, mm -hmm. or law library in general? Well, let's say both. Let's say for the, oh, not for the law library. Let's say for the, the, the building libraries that we were talking about. I think you said there were three of them, and or maybe even to the library cart. Are there times when um, a, a punishment or something like that would say you can't go to library or you can't uh, get something off the cart? Not retaliation or punitive reasons, sir. If there's a safety concern, perhaps, but that would be the exclusion. And what type of a safety concern? If you were discovered and found guilty of passing contraband in that manner, if you were found guilty of an infraction where there was an act of violence after the disposition, then there may be some um, sanctions as it relates to that incident, but not punitive and not in retaliation. Okay, um, and what are the hours at the facilities, um, at the facility libraries? Sir, for instance, at EMTC, the library services uh, take place every Friday from 9 to 12. At MDC, I would need to get that scheduled for you. And for uh, Rosie's, I would have to get that. So I have two jails that I would have to get that particular okay. schedule for I'd you. like to get that also. Yes, sir. Uh, and does DOC work with any other outside organizations to bring books in? Not at this time, we're currently working with um, the three public libraries, and as we stated earlier, that family members could drop off up to three books, I believe it is, for uh, an individual to, to have in their possession. And they can drop off three per visit? If I may add, the amount isn't dictated by the volume. Within these restrictions, there's a certain spacing requirement, how you're housed, so we have to, in the dorm edit, it's about the spacing that's permissive, not the volume of uh, actual publications. So what would be the general rule in terms of how many books uh, a family could bring? If a person did not have any material and the amount didn't violate the spacing requirements. So what is that spacing requirement? I have it, but I didn't write that in my notes, so I could provide it later. Okay. Um, you know, it's a, you're a little bit unprepared for answering um, questions about the library when you knew this was going to be the legislation and then you were opposed to the legislation. So I'm a little bit surprised about that. But um, I hopefully will have a follow-up uh, letter to you on, on these questions. Um, well, let me ask some questions about connections. Um, I'm getting a lot of complaints that the connections book is not being distributed. Uh, pursuant to local law, is the DOC providing connections to every individual upon admission? Thank you for that question, sir. Um, this is our 2018 edition, and I'm happy to report that we just print, we're in the process and actually distributing as we speak um, the first piece of 7,000 copies of the Connections book. And so in 2018, we had um, 700 copies that were released, uh, distributed to f facilities. <coughs> and then in uh, January of 2019, I'm sorry, 2018, 4,500 4, copies were distributed to our facilities. In January, uh, we had a 700 uh, copy batch made, and just we are in the process now of distributing the first set of our 7,000 uh, of the uh, reentry handbook. So does the 4,500 number match the number of admissions Currently, the with same our period? Excellent question. With our current batch of 7,000, we looked at each facility and we looked at those that discharge information, and then we match that co correspondingly. And so you, you're saying that um, it does match? It does match for the, d the amount of discharges, yes. Okay. Um, is DOC publishing the newest, oh, you just said that? That, that 700 is the, is, the, is the latest publication? Sir, 7,000 through EMTC in our print shop. Oh, okay, 7,000? 7, Correct, sir. Okay, 7,000. Um, Sir, if I have an opportunity to sure. follow back on the initial question on what the permissible space is, one cubic foot 12 by 12 by 12 of non-legal printed materials, including soft and hardcover books, magazines, newspapers, periodicals, pamphlets, advertisements, and other, permiss and other printed articles. These items must be neatly stored as to avoid constituting a health or fire hazard. Not, no limit is on legal material, law books, publications, where the spacing in a cell is limited. All alternative methods of safely storing legal materials 
elsewhere in the institution. So that's the description on what they could have that's not legal material. Legal material, there is no um, limit. And if it uh, poses a threat in terms of space, then we store it off site. Okay. So those are our guidelines on what they could permit it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Sure, if I, if I can also add that with our connections book, that's upon, that's upon discharge. However, in all of our new admission units, we also have a uh, Beyond the Bridge uh, booklet for every new admission, and that has resources for in all the boroughs. So everyone is getting information coming into the system as well as upon discharge. Okay, um, I want to thank the chair for his generous uh, allotment of time to me. Of course, there's many more questions, and I'll follow up with you as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to hand it over to Councilman Richards on his bill, and I know some members had some follow-up questions just on these two bills, and then I'll jump in. I'm here all day, so I'm, I'm not all day. I mean, <laughs> so I'll let them, I'll give them an opportunity to go uh, first. Councilman thank Richards. You. Thank you for being so generous. Uh, can you start off with just speaking about um, what's the total allotment uh, in the budget that goes towards programming? while you get that answer, unless you're ready. Thank you, sir. So as, as we know, um, over the last several years, there's been quite an investment in the programming and services division of the, of the department. So I'd like to thank the council, as well as the mayor and the mayor's office, in terms of helping us uh, support this mission. So um, in fiscal year 19, um, 38.1 million, and fiscal year 18, 38.1 million. So 38.1 million. And that goes to the variety of programming. Program services happens. and yes. Now, just take me through. So I, I'm a detainee. I come into Rikers. Um, how do I learn about these programs and services? Excellent. If, so if I can, I'd like to break it down to young adults first and then to uh, our adult population. So with our young adults, we have admission units in RNDC. So upon entrance into that a new admission housing unit, they're going to be met by DOE staff as well as our own internal staff. And what they're, at, at that point, they're offered information on um, our educational program. The DOE goes how, to how are they offered? Are they given a piece of paper? Uh, they're, ver they're met with, a, there, there's a physical interaction between so staff verbal. and individual, okay. correct. Mm -hmm. uh, DOE actually just recently has even gone a step further to, because um, they have access to transcript and educational information, that they'll actually have the information um, to provide to the individual about where they are in their educational history and what they need to do to complete their education um, uh, achievement. We also have education specialists that bolster that, that process up as well. And also the education specialists and correctional counselors, uh, youth counselors also offer opportunity, um, information on what's the next step for them in terms of moving from the new admissions unit to a housing unit. So they're offered information on programs, education, and services. Also, through our, our relationship with Friends of Island Academy and the Youth Reentry Network, there is also a touch there as well by uh, those organizations, that, org that entity, to uh, link them up to stakeholders in the community or to give them that support um, upon release. So there's a touch both by an external provider, external providers, internal staff, and DOE. In our adult population, not very different, but for the educational component in terms of the educational history that the DOE has um, for younger adults, young adults, um, all adults that are met in our new admission unit, um, physical um, interfacing, verbal information regarding what's provided to them as they move on, through, this, through the system, as well as they're offered a brochure which has external resources in the community. Because as we know, we have a large portion of our new admissions that are gonna be released. So we want to ensure that they have this vital reentry book when they come on board, and then they'll also get that connections book as well. So in that book, it's, it's the external programming Yes. So I meant, so, but when they come in, it's it's given to them verbally the information on what programming exists. Yes, but as so, why not have both options? As we heard in my testimony in June, we're going to have a programs menu that is okay. facility specific. 
and that would be offered to them not verbally, but with a physical copy exactly. of something that they would exactly. know is available to them. Um, can you go through the average number of hours of programming an individual receives? So as we know, we have a mandate to provide five hours of programming. Um, this has been a uh, mission of our division and the department to meet that five hours across all housing units. And so we know that through our recent analysis that we're not achieving that goal. Mm -hmm. If we look at our NDC with our younger popu with our young adult population, yep. we are meeting that. Yep. We are meeting that with our young adults. We are meeting that with our young adult uh, female population. Mm -hmm. But we know that we can do better and we strive to do better. And we're, we're, in a, we're in that process right now of doing that analysis to see where our gaps are and then to fill them with uh, internal, external providers, as well as our volunteer base. All right, great answer. Now, why is it that you're not meeting uh, the minimum requirements? What, what would you attribute that to? Capacity. It, it's a logistical challenge. We have approximately 300 housing units that are occupied by individuals, and so that would take a large contingent of staff in order to provide that. So, so you need more staffing, you're saying? Well, what? What we're doing right now is we're analyzing where the gaps are and how we can better utilize our current resources. From what I saw when I visited last summer, a lot of people aren't taking, necessarily taking, and the adult population aren't taking advantage of the programming because they don't feel the programming suits. They didn't feel like they had an array of options when it came to programming. So would you say that that is one of the reasons a large percentage of people are not taking advantage of these programs? It's an excellent question, and it's hard to answer globally. <laughs> if, 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 let, me, let me explain further. Mm -hmm. There are sections of our population that are just focused on their trial and what may await them down the road. So they become, they tend to be more case specific and not interested for a variety of reasons mm -hmm. in addition to their case. And then we have other individuals, yes indeed, you're absolutely correct, that are interested in more than what we offer in that particular housing unit. Um, and we try, we're, we try as best as possible to meet those needs and be responsive to those needs. We're hearing what they're saying. We're hearing as well from external providers and even in our own internal staff of s certain areas are looking for more than just soft skill development. They're interested in an OSHA 30 certification. Mm -hmm. They're interested in other hard skill um, development and sometimes with this population initially we had to look at how do we build that into a program package that keeps individuals motivated to work on their soft skill development their emotional wellness their cognitive restructuring as well as that hard skill development and so it's a work in progress I think we've made great great strides in that area but we can we can do better and how do you gauge if the programming that you're doing is, is successful uh, we look at our participation rates, okay. and generally they, they've been hovering right around 40% um, without looking at my specific information right here. Um, and so what we try to do is engage with family engagement activities, other um, milestone event achievements in terms of offering them uh, a special event with not only the external provider, uh, whether it's Fortune or Osborne or one of our other providers or our own internal staff, security staff get involved with that as well to try to keep them motivated to try to boost these numbers up. So if you look at um, 2018, it's, it's in a 40% engagement for our, our re-entry soft skill development programming. All righty. Um, I mean, I, I didn't, and I don't want to, downplay the work you're trying to do, but I just did not get that feeling when I was, was in there that we're really meeting the needs of the, the detainees. Um, and then let me just, last question. Um, so just speak to what's the follow-up when individuals get out, right? So how do you gauge, so you're saying you have this wonderful programming inside, then when people get outside, they get this glossy pamphlet and you send them on their way to external programmers that yeah. perhaps were doing some work with them internally. What is the follow-up work you do? Um, do you track um, the rates of recidivism? Do you track, um, did they successfully obtain a job? And, and are they keeping that job? What, what is the, the, the long-term 
um, strategy around ensuring that the programming you're offering internally is followed up externally, but that, you know, obviously there's a, a success rate that you're tracking? Sure. Great question. Uh, on both a large global macro perspective as well as in a logistical operational perspective. Uh, recidivism rates, that's going to be ter determined by a party, uh, a branch other than myself in terms of what, who is defining what recidivism is. That to me is more of a, a mayoral or, or a city council uh, definition because that can vary from state to state, from agency to agency on how recidivism is defined. Is it going to be defined as a new crime? Is it going to be defined as contact with law enforcement? That requires an integration of multiple different systems to try to determine what a true recidivism rate is. Do you think that the city should explore that? Absolutely. If it's not, if it's not being done already, absolutely. I mean, that's vital information for us not only to, to determine on both the state and city level um, whether our programs are working, um, and that gives us further information into what may be going wrong. I, we have our national averages across the board that have been done by very comprehensive studies of what recidivism rates are. So that's, that's a very large global perspective on whether programming works, age groups, demographics. In terms of our own um, analysis, due to the merger of young adults and adults, we're now able to set that course and we are on that course to look at not only internally, how our programs are doing, what the participation rates are, what attendance rates are in education, but also to look to the community with our external providers to, to start digging into that engagement in the community and uh, work and housing, how successful are our external providers with that. So there's ongoing dialogue, just as a, a couple of weeks ago, over the definitions for, for certain topics. What does participation mean? What does it mean in terms of contact in the community? So we are on that course to further clarify how successful our program programming is in terms of continuity into the community. I want to thank you um, for uh, indulging me. Um, I will say the, the first way to gauge and know if what you're doing is working is to actually speak to the individuals who are using the product and that would be the detainees, um, certainly. And I, I was so impressed by it. I talk about them all the time because, um, you know, when I went in, they weren't complaining about the food. I thought that's what I was going to hear. We want better food. What they were complaining about was the need for a better law library and better programming and access to programming that they actually are interested in, in utilizing. So I don't want to undercut anything you're, you're saying. But I think, you know, this is the impetus of us coming up with this survey so that at least you can, we can gauge that knowledge um, and, and have a precise way of measuring uh, if what we're doing is, is really working in a, in a realistic way, in a global way, as you said. So um, I look forward to working with you. I also would urge, and I, and I forgot if we wrote this in, that we talk to the Osbournes and other organizations along the way of developing the survey to make sure that we're not leaving uh, anything out that would be uh, important legal aid, whoever works with these individuals on a daily basis. Um, if, if I could add just one comment. I believe last summer you visited OVCC, Otis Phantom Correctional Center, I believe. I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was. Right, so I happened to be there that day. I'm sure you don't remember. I, I do remember you. No, I have a forgettable face, and that's okay. And it was okay. a good barbecue going on that day. Well, then so, you do, yeah, so, so yes. <laughs> and so what I can say, to speak to your point on how you gauge, because I was very active, I worked in that facility as a correction officer and through the ranks, <laughs> um, even up until assistant chief. I was assigned to that facility and various other facilities. The competing things that are not stated the understated challenges that represent that particular population that's there and similarly in other facilities is when we all get together sometimes we don't get together in a safe way mm -hmm. so we have to consider how mm -hmm. we congregate mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. which can impact your use of the service right. which when talking with the population as you describe is just the best way to get the information that's what the communication is. And I've had that experience in other ranks as well, where I'm assigned to the facility exclusively and we talk regularly. 
because this group may not want to participate in something with that group. And that's a challenge because we have certain criteria to engage a service, right? We have to have certain folk to have a chaplain. We have to have a licensed bar, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's a conversation that we're continuously having with the population of a facility similar to the one that we uh, interacted with last summer. So I don't want that part to get lost on our engagement mm -hmm. or assessment. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say survey, that's maybe not appropriate, mm -hmm. but our assessment and engaging and asking, mm -hmm. how can we get everyone there as prescribed? So mm -hmm. I just wanted to share that. Well, I hope we're looking to, to, to things like coding and you know, really out of the box. That's what they were asking for. Mm -hmm. You know, not the soft, yes. you know, but some things that they can, skills they can really take and utilize in the world when they leave out. Yeah. So, in, in terms of the bill, sir, I think um, one of the points that that we put forth was for us to collaborate and work together and maybe look at that timeline. Um, I'm professionally familiar with surveys in, in with incarcerated persons, and vital information can come out of that. Not only from a programming perspective, from a grievance perspective, as well as from operational. Uh, perspective case management. So if we take our time and, and are contemplative about that, I think we could um, gain a lot of information on what we're doing well and what we could work on. I mean, in terms of uh, direct programming, in, in terms of that question that some are, are not pleased with what the offerings are, I urge you to visit our, our veterans unit where we, in collaboration with Samaritan Village, I am working in conjunction with the city's veterans um, agency as well as the VA. Um, you see there a continuity of services from not only internal in terms of um, that soft skill development that some are resistant to because there's not a certification attached to it in terms of employment, but um, it's, a, it's a very small group naturally um, in terms of our veterans that are interested in um, being housed together to as like-minded individuals to work on their issues, to work on their needs. Um, if our transgender unit, um, if you visit that housing area as well, you'll see that, that the services that are being provided are directly related to um, gender identity and to supporting them both while they're incarcerated as well as going out. So, um, but as we all know, as, as you grow the population in terms of uh, of the program menu and, and those that the scope of the individuals involved, there's always going to be a percentage of those that are not. But as you stated, and I state as well, and and our department, we can always do better, and that's where that survey will definitely come in handy. Right, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, but I want to say this bill goes into effect immediately, so I know you want to take your time with the survey, but I don't think it takes 365 days to get a survey done. So let's try to work on getting this done. Uh, um, fairly in a responsible manner, but not taking 500 days to get this done. Thank you, sir. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, we're going to move to Council Member Holden, and then I think Council, Council Member Ann Presenting. Thank you, Chair Powers. I just want to follow up, and by the way, thanks for your testimony. Um, Commissioner, I just want to find, f follow up on uh, Council Member Drum's remarks and questions about books and punitive segregation. Um, is there a logic? why we're not providing books or even a, a bookshelf full, filled with books, possibly recommended by a counselor or uh, a mentor? I think we have to look at the housing area and why, and there are certain protocols that are in place for specialized housing or restrictive housing, which we could deem uh, punitive segregation. Um, if you think of, if you look at the logistics of providing library services across the, globally across um, our department to all housing units. We rely on a very small cadre of library staff to facilitate that mission. And so we have a finite number of people to assist in that. That's why we're looking forward to the future of how we could do better, how we can expand library services through a, m a more mobile, mobile system. Um, Generally speaking, an individual that is in a restricted specialized housing area would not be escorted to the library. That's a security issue that I'll, I'll allow no, the chief. No, but my question is a little different. Why wouldn't we have a stationary bookshelf in punitive segregation on self-help or something to read? It's, it's, it's kind of inhumane to put somebody in a, in a 10 by 6 cell with nothing to read. 
wouldn't it be prudent, I mean, actually smart, to put a number of books that they could read and actually better themselves? I mean, it doesn't take much money, I would think, just to leave the books there. I'm not asking for a library services. What we would like them to read, probably to help them. I agree, and that's why I look forward to the, the points well taken and that moving forward. Can we can we do it without a, a bill? Can we? I mean, could we put a bookshelf? Does anybody anybody in corrections feel that that's a reward for going into punitive segregation to have some books there? Absolutely not, sir. Okay, so I would think that we can start immediately without a, any legislation. That somebody should figure out that let's put some books in there. Let's let's the, even tailor it to the person going in there because. What the, their behavior, their their interests. That's where we, you know, if they're in the, in the, I don't know how long they're in punitive segregation. It could be days, weeks, possibly. It's it's inhumane to just leave them in there, and it's actually to our benefit, the public's benefit, to put in a bookshelf. I'm not asking for a, a library, a bookshelf. I agree, and also um, to amplify um, some of our efforts there, we do have correctional counselors in that service that area that do provide information for them. For those individuals that are interested on, in self-help, that um, paper materials are provided to them and there's engagement, sell side, as well as one-on-one -on -one with individuals. But point, absolutely, I agree with you, Mr. Holt. Okay, good. One other question, Chair, if, I'm, if I may. Um, you, you mentioned you want to increase the volunteer services. How many volunteers do we have now in the system? Approximately 1,200. 1,200 volunteers is a lot, so that's, it's, a lot. that's great. And what, what's, uh, they come in all walks of life, different, uh, uh, some, some are former teachers, retired teachers possibly, or executives? It, it crosses the strata of those, both faith-based and non-based. And, and how, do you, how do you reach out to them? How do we get the word out that um, you, you want volunteers and, and can we get any details on that? So I'm, I'm happy to report that just as recently as yesterday that we created an email portal, which is on our website for individuals that are interested in um, seeking out volunteer opportunities to email our division directly for us to uh, start that engagement process. We heard from um, in our meeting last week that there, there is some um, uncertainty about how someone can get involved. Um, there is... Um, pocket with our particular young adult division, just due to our enormous roster of subcontractors and contractors and people wanting to be engaged, um, that we have, that there's visible and, and knowing f names and faces for people to reach out to or to be referred to. And um, we're looking, that's one of our plans is to improve that area. And I believe that we start, we've just started with the, the, on our website to have that email portal that email link for, for Yeah, that, that's great, because I get a lot of people coming into the office, they're retired from teaching, or and they just feel they want to do something. And I, I never knew that we could actually get volunteers into the uh, into the jails and actually help. So that, that's, uh, it's an enlightening me, obviously, but I think what we have to do is get the word out, like you're, you're doing, you're starting to do, but that's, I think it's an important step. So actually the um, detainee could have somebody to talk to and, and count and they can get more counseling and or more help based on life experiences. So thank you very much. But for even that. behind beyond yeah. that, Mr. Holden, it's a different face. It's right. it's someone from the outside. It's a volunteer, exactly. someone that they don't see every single day, and they look forward to that. And it could be just. It can also be used as a way to keep someone motivated over a course of a few days or a week, whatever the schedule for that volunteer is. So I think that the email link is going to be. It's going to be extremely valuable. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, <coughs> and Councilmember Amprey Samuel. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma'am. I visited, well, we visited Rikers Island last year, and I don't remember exactly which unit we were on or which house, but this is just in reference to um, the young men who were restrained to desk. Um, they were pretty young, and at the time we visited, they were taking an exam of some sort, where each individual were taking like a different exam, and there was someone standing over them. So just in reference to those individuals, what type of programming is available for those specific individuals who are restrained to desk? Uh, thank you for your question. That's our enhanced supervision area. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, I'm sorry, I, I might have missed it. 
young adults? Was that your specific question regarding young adults or young adults and adults? So whoever was strained to the okay. desk. Like, so what's the what's the type of programming that's available to those individuals that are detained, but so the ones who are restrained to the desk? So we have uh, both individual, group, um, facilitation, education, and we have tablet tablet based uh, programming as well. So on our young adult end, we have uh, tablets as well as engagement by our counseling staff. And the same can be said for adults. And uh, we've- So what type of setting is it? Be and, and just, just so my observation and just my lens was me going into this facility and just seeing rows of individuals who are restrained to desk. So how do you provide programming? So so are they then you know removed from the from the desk and then taken someplace else, or is the programming in that same facility? So can you just explain Pro to programming me? Programming is I done on the floor at our program desks, and uh, we also knowing some of the some of the unique needs and concerns of that population in terms of uh, security risk group history that um, what we have seen and responded to is that a lot of those individuals do not want to engage in group work for various reasons in regards to their, their, their gang affiliation. So what we've done is use a strategy of tablet um, programming as well. So we have a series of podcasts and messages from individuals that have stepped out of SRG slash gang life, and uh, have been successful on the outside. So what we've done is embedded that programming into tablet form. So when an individual is in his in his cell, that he could um, gain that confidence and sense of security to be able to listen to that type of message, that type of programming, uh, while he's one while he's alone, and then can work independent or work work one on one with a counselor. We also have education that takes place there on the floor as well. So with the efforts of DOE, we have two teachers dedicated to that area to work with our individuals that are on level one. And we're talking a very small number of, of individuals, by the way, not large numbers of, of uh, individuals that are at that level one status. So summarily, uh, group work on the floor at the program tables, and that's education, group work, as well as working independently. We have one-on-one -on -one engagement at the tables. If others, those that are involved are not interested in sharing or processing in a group format. And then we have one-on-one -on -one by cell that whether through tablet form or other journal work, interactive journaling. How do you do a group format in that type of setting? On the floor? Mm -hmm. Two or three individuals that are, that are at the program tables would, it would be facilitated with an individual that is working with the with those that are participating, whether how they you know it's positioning and um, facilitation. If if I may add some context to the environment, I think you're describing is well I, that I know you're describing is the young adult enhanced supervision. So these are individuals who have demonstrated an inability to safely interact with their peers. Mm -hmm. And this is only limited to serious acts of violence against another individual or staff member. Mm -hmm. It is a uh, adjudicated process that is documented and is evidenced by an objective uh, body that adjudicates this incident. And their stay at those desks are very limited. Mm -hmm. And then for the first, I believe, 15 days, it is reviewed. And unless an, um, a similar act of violence has occurred, then they are to be removed and leveled up. So this process, although... So the level up would be, would they then go to a level one or to a level two? To a level two, 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 where they will okay. not... That level that you uh, described is for the extreme and only extreme acts of violence against another individual or staff member that has been documented and adjudicated. Right, so at any given time, um, even though at, at your occasion you described several, there's normally, uh, I would say, the ca the capacity that I've seen is three, because in that individual space, I'm sorry, this is just a hypothetical. I'm oh, not, okay, because it was I'm like, not, I'm I, not I, I thought it was like the, 10 of them. Right, more, yeah. so we have several desks, but we have separation, so if you're at one desk, you're not gonna be right next to this oh, person, okay. mm -hmm. so they're spaced out again, that's based on safety. And uh, so I wanted to give context to that, although appearing 
perhaps a little bit difficult to, on the eye, and I can understand that because it is difficult to, uh, to see someone. But if I could just put the context of how you got there and the length of time that you can stay there, and the, this is something, this is a process that's weighed up to the chief of the department. So everyone in this agency, that's a high priority housing area that you're describing. Okay. If I can add one more thing, ma'am, uh, one of the big steps that we took as a division in our ESH housing area is uh, at the beginning of 2018, we commenced multidisciplinary team meetings with individuals that are housed there. So unlike years past, individuals are brought before a multidisciplinary team that encompasses counseling staff, uh, uniform leadership, those that are working directly with those individuals. And as the chief said, we've either further uh, refined uh, length of stay at ver uh, for those reviews and it's a holistic interaction between um, individual and the team where they're, uh, th as we speak about uh, response and feedback and surveys from, our, from the individuals, we act, they, they were given an opportunity to provide feedback to us, the logistics, the programming, um, the food, everything that revolves around being housed in, our, in that ESH area they, they provide criticism to us and for us to do better in terms of providing a better learning experience for them there. So over 1,200 reviews have taken place since January. We, we, we meet on a weekly basis and our goal is to certainly at level one for adults and young adults to safely move them through the system because as the chief says, some uh, violent act has been committed before that placement and we just want to ensure safety for all involved, both themselves, others, as well as staff. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, thank you. And thanks to all the members who are still here and ask some questions. And I, I want to take a, a couple, um, ask a couple, just take a step back. I know the members had a number of questions, but I want to just, for just to start, you guys had announced here at working group of, um, kind of a new working group with the providers quarterly. I know there's a number of providers here, and we obviously had a roundtable last week. Can you just start by telling me what that might look like and how would groups participate in that or chosen for that, and how what should be some expectations here for the groups that are would, would be interested in that? Thank you, Chair. I, I can't recall whether I um, spoke about what currently goes on now in terms of biweekly phone calls or face-to-face -face between ourselves and our external providers. and. Um, monthly meetings that take place as well um, with m our division and as well as external providers. But it, what we took away from that, from that roundtable discussion mm -hmm. was that more could be done. So we're exploring what that agenda would look like. We already know that we're, we're discussing weekly regarding participation rates, uh, bi biweekly regarding participation rates. So we have and, and we talk staffing as well on their end of if there's vacancy. So we have that logistical piece that's being addressed. But what can we do as a better partner in terms of maybe it's access that with um, myself included and other leadership involved, both uniform and non-uniform staff, that to address those issues that they spoke about in terms of access into facilities, how we can better manage that day-to-day -day operation to ensure that our facilitators are getting to where they need to go. So by having that higher ranking um, staff members involved, that, that they can send a message to the facilities of how we can uh, grant better access. So um, I, I'm, no, I'm, I just, I'm sorry, maybe, maybe you were answering, but I, the question I was really asking was I'm a, this statement. I'm a proud to announce the department will be creating a program provider working group that will meet quarterly. The group will be enable the department to get direct feedback from our programming partners and able to access suggestions and concerns in real time. So is that, that's that's an that's an announcement that you're making today, right? Is that a new announcement? Correct. This, okay. So if you're a provider here today, some are testifying, some are obviously interested in this group. Is this this will be a group of providers that will be meeting with the Department of Corrections on a quarterly basis to provide feedback? Yes. Is that correct? That that announcement will go out of that meeting, and anyone can attend that's interested in coming and expressing, uh, offering some feedback. And those will be hosted where? Uh, I would say Boulevard. That's our headquarters, which okay. is probably the best, the best place. Okay, and how will you be circulating information to groups to know if they want to be part of that? Electronically through email as well as phone calls. 
Okay, and that will sort of resemble the format that we had last week with the groups, sort of. Exactly. Okay, great. Thank you for that, and um, uh, and and for making a commitment on that because I know many folks were interested in having more opportunities sure. to get feedback. How many providers do you have today for programming? I would, I if I can categorize mm -hmm. it in, in two. I know you guys do some programming as well, but yeah, go ahead. So we have, um, if I can break it off into buckets, mm -hmm. we have eleven primary providers, and, uh, and I use that term to encompass everyone, but we have 11 large contracts, and then through those contracts, we have sub-providers. So it's our providers, it's our 11, and, and that would be Fortune, Osborne, SCO, Friends of Island Academy, uh, Samaritan Village, and then there's also subs under that, that work in partnership with those larger entities. And do you know how many sub-providers sub you have, subcontractors? I could get that number for you, Chair, in terms of, it's a long roster, yeah. it's particularly in our young adult area. And a subcontractor has to be approved by Department of Corrections before beginning yes. their work. And how do, how do the 11 providers get chosen? It's through an RFP? Correct, sir. Got it. And what, how long is the term of the RFP? Um, the, last, the ones that are currently coming like, up? Yeah, how long are they? Three years. Coming? Three years, okay, got it. And then they choose, sub, they choose subcontractors, and those contractors get chosen, they get approved by you, and then their volunteers presumably have to be cleared by yes, sir. you as well. Okay, thanks. Um, we talked about the goals here. I said this in my in my opening statement that I thought the goals were really uh, sort of in, you know, reducing recidivism and improving misconduct or behavior or bad behavior, I guess, <coughs> in the settings. Do you share that as like the two primary goals? Absolutely. Okay, and and it doesn't sound like today those are being measured in any way, and maybe they're difficult in some manner to, to, to define and to measure, but it sounds like we're, to, we're doing this mostly through participation rather than, and, and I, understand, I understand why that's an easy sort of metric to pull immediately, but if the goal is really those two other items, participation sort of serves to those goals, it strikes me, but doesn't actually measure whether, the, that's, that whether they're any group or any program is meeting that specific goal. And um, so may maybe you can just share with me your thoughts or what process is going on in terms of how to measure those other two items. Um, recidivism, I, I disagreed with your notion that you guys couldn't study. And I mean, it's not predominantly your, but maybe it's not your own, you have, you, you have a number of missions here, correct? Right, right, right. The programming part is to, sir, is to decrease recidivism. Hopefully you never see people back in your custody correct. again. Um, I think the statement was the mayor's office or city council's role was to measure that or study that. Or to or define it. To define, to define it, okay. Um, I think we can define it together, Absolutely. but I, my real question is how are you measuring programs to know they're meeting that goal? And how are you measuring uh, programs to know they're also improving conduct? If I can walk the, uh, the council through the process, um, how we've progressed. With the merger of the young adults and adults, and even before that, we focused initially on process, on how to gather the information. And that's a series of steps. And as I stated earlier, over the last few months, we've made great strides in capturing information and starting that analytical process of seeing where the gaps in, for instance, the five hours are. So we made incredible strides there. We started. Uh, a deeper dive and, an, and gathering information from the community end of things, of what is happening in the community in terms, and uh, speaking to about outputs and outcomes and milestones, how many individuals have acquired work, how many um, ha found housing. So that's ways to measure the success of the program. Um, evaluations will take place as we further refined our process now the next step as we move further along is while we there are some current evaluations that have taken place that what more can we do moving forward? So that's the formal way in which to evaluate our program successes and in terms of recidivism, yes. As that is defined by uh, collaboration between individuals about what we want to define as recidivism, that is our look on the outside. There's also a look on the inside in terms of misconduct, grievances. I think that programming plays a part in that in terms of institutional success. Uh, 
we, we look at medical information um, in terms of sick call success and getting people there timely. We look at court protection in terms of do we get individuals to court on time. We can also, I think, look at institutional issues on are we having an impact. Then there's that informal evaluation that can take place through a survey, through immediate feedback from individuals that are in our care, as well as from our providers and volunteers of looking at, for instance, our reentry program, whether it's ICANN or SMART, that feedback from participants as well as facilitators and internal and external staff that that module is just not exactly working. There is not, a so there is not that responsivity from it that we're looking for. Uh, we, for a good example of that is uh, Cage or Rage, which, which is a, a workbook-based program that we are providing in, in ESH. So there was not a lot of gr great response to that or interactive journaling. Sometimes they're not grabbing onto that. So what other means can we use to start to shift that thinking or at least to enlighten, th to, to give them that engagement for the day? Um, a, a great example in our ESH area is the performing arts where at times we found with, at this time in which I'm gonna speak about, there wasn't a lot of responsivity to interactive journaling. There was just resistance to that. So we used performing arts to, to try to engage that, pop, that audience to pull out some of the things that they were processing. They just did it in a different manner. So we're always looking at creative ways. So that's that informal evaluation that could be done in real time. Okay, and, and it sounds like you actually identified a third goal, which would be sort of improving some institutional outcomes, whether it's improving gr the grievance problem. I mean, just sort of serving the, the, in the sort of institutional goals around ensuring people have proper information and things like that as well. And Chair, if I can just yeah. interrupt real quickly, our graduated sanction level system in GRBC, that pilot program, is an attempt to address that. We heard from, from um, our staff member, we're looking at certain behaviors, certain incidents that have taken place, and whether through an incentive-based level system that we can see that we will realize a decrease in incidents in that particular facility. Is that pilot program completed or still happening? No, it's still happening. Still, still happening. When is it, when do you anticipate it finishes or you have some data that lets you come up with a, a larger? As one of the stakeholders in that particular um, Project. Well, I mean, we a, pi a pilot suggests it's a as, trial see, period. Right, we see that as long-standing. There those. may be some tweaks to, to it, but it's all based on individual conduct, and which is, which is, as you would look at other institutions around the country, it's based on individual progress versus group progress, so to speak, and we're also looking at replicating that in another facility as well, so. Okay, and, and, and so I, I would encourage, um, you know, that there, as you sort of set goals here, you have a, appropriate ways to measure it. I think participation, by the way, is not a bad, one bad metric to have here to know that people actually want to take advantage of it and be in it. But the question is whether it's actually serving a purpose beyond um, uh, taking advantage of it. I did want to note, though, we, we received uh, from a, law, a local law 122, which is passed in 2016, I think 2016, um, we got we received a report from the DOC about different programs, and we do we get and I'm happy to I can hold it up, but you won't be able to see it. Um, uh, you, you report to us information, but you don't have any participation data in it, or very for, for many of the programs or completion data. So where the data we're getting from the DOC. Um, from local law 122 for the calendar year 2017, for instance, um, we're we're getting data from you. You're you're measuring it by participation. It seems like primarily as one you know major metric about whether programs are working or meeting uh, meeting the constituency that wants to take advantage of programming. But yet we're getting no data from you guys. I mean, there's, these are all NAs here, not available. Can you explain why you can't report that to us? I can and we'll have to get you more information on that, Chair, but what I want to stress is that over the last several years, the amount of programming and the size of staff has, has grown exponentially. And with that has become various um, reporting um, requirements. And not every reporting requirement is the same. And so as we've grown to try to meet the needs 
of various reporting requirements, it's hard to fit how some of the technological limitations that we've had can fit into some of the reporting structures. So um, that is just part of our growing process. And we're actually going back and look as we move forward and collecting in real time and meeting the needs of various requests for information and data. We've also done a look back to try to correct some of the information that was reported out in the past. So as I, ha I have 122 here in terms of the law and, requi and the, what's required, I would have to go back and look at that exact report with the NAs and talk to my team of why there are NAs there. And, and I, uh, I, I, pre I would appreciate that. But I mean, we, we, we often try to pass these laws to give us and folks who are uh, uh, working in this w area to a better understanding of what's meeting it. And, and I know that, um, uh, you know, sometimes we're asking for one set of data, you have others asking for other sets of data, and it's hard to reconcile them. And I can tell you I'm always committed to trying to make these, re re these lots of reporting requirements put on the agencies meet their actual intended goal and not make them burdensome, but ensure that we, and if we're asking for one similar set of data as the BOC is asking to try to streamline those, those uh, information. But I will say it's, it's somewhat, um, and without an, really an accompanying statement explaining why there's not any uh, you know, data here, like DOC counseling services, your own DOC counselor-led programs, no participation, data, no completion data, or a number of the groups actually do. I just, I don't want to pick on any specific one, but Fortune Society has the participation data reported here, uh, but most of the groups don't have completion data. And I understand the, the completion becomes a set, separate set of issues, but you know, at the minimum, I would, we would want some things to explain why we can't have even the participation data, because it even sounds like to me that's your pr primary measurement here is whether people are taking advantage of it but aren't actually able to uh, count how many people actually participated at any, at any point in time, or for a calendar year, rather. Sure. Chair, excellent point. I wasn't there for public testimony regarding that law, and um, I w so I'm unaware of wh whether there was discussion on reporting standards and definition and how it's, it, it's Great to hear what you just said about hearing from the agencies on how they're report capturing information and reporting out that it meets your need as well as our ability to collect that information. So I uh, respectfully request an opportunity to refresh my memory with that and then get back to you on it. But it all comes down to that we're looking for that robust system so we can report out in a more timely and keep um, providing accurate information. Can you follow up with that point? So what, what is the system you're looking for? Is it a, are you making a budget ask of it or have you? And it sounds like you need some technological uh, uh, update here. But, um, but And then sec maybe start with what, what is the system today for tracking people and p participation rates in a program? How is that being tracked? And then what are, what are the systems that you need to do this more effectively? If I, if I can present it so eloquently in this, these terms, it's a paper-based process of capturing information. A group takes place in a housing unit and there, an attendance sheet is filled out. That attendance sheet is then transposed into an Excel spreadsheet, which is then transposed into another spreadsheet. And with some of our areas, we're talking thousands and thousands of rows that have been captured over time which has its, in, its own inherent risks. And um, our team, our department, if you think about that sort of mechanical process, ultimately is then transposed if, uh, if you've seen a BOC report, particularly for young adults in our specialized housing areas. Our team then takes all that information and then put to get to, puts it together into a substantive report. So a lot of effort goes into taking this information and putting it together into uh, some, si some type of report. So um, one of the things when I talk about strides that we've made, even within that context, 
is that we've reached out to our external partners to get better definitions on how they're viewing, how they're defining certain things as, as something like work or temporary housing versus permanent housing. How are our partners defining those things so we're all, all on the same page? So when we report out for the next, next fiscal year, particularly in terms of that law, that there will be a more comprehensive, more informative report. Um, I, I appreciate that, and we have spent a lot of time in the council, uh, uh, pu you know, pushing, but I certainly supporting technical, you know, the, the sort of technology that you guys need to do your jobs better, to track these outcomes better. Um, but I want to ask, uh, when the who who's who's actually collecting this data? Is it is it DOC staff or is it the provider it's that's providing like headcount data for a particular? session or day? It's both. So an external provider comes on board and they're gonna, they have an attendance sheet that they complete. They transpose it to a spreadsheet which then goes to a supervisor within their, within their organization which then is shared with uh, DOC staff. So you have all these providers and subcontractors who are just filling this stuff out on a piece of paper, giving it, working some way up Vertically. a food chain and then ending up in an Excel spreadsheet. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, pardon my surprise. I mean, pardon my feeling that that is an inefficient way maybe to do it. I'm not saying with all the groups that there's necessarily an easy way, but it seems like a lot of opportunities for miscounting or, 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 or hard to track. You also, I'm guessing, don't track individual progress then? You don't, or you don't, you're not tracking by an individual. You're tracking by how many people, like, Took a, took advantage of it. It's just it's just a head count, right? It's not a per person sort of tracking system of whether somebody's taking advantage of knowing what they're taking advantage of. So, chair, if you looked at one of our tracking sheets, you would see every single housing unit has individual names that are gathered by daily rosters because some leave, mm -mm. some get transferred, some move to a different housing unit, and those are taken off and new names are placed on. And if you look across column to column to column for that individual with his booking case number, you'll see the amount of time that was spent, whether it was individualized counseling, social services, group participation, and then go down that spreadsheet. And then particularly for group participation, you'll see what that particular group was. So, so you do know an individual person, sort of what they're taking, what what programming they're doing or how much programming they're getting, is that yes, correct? Yes, but as we, look, as we look at, for instance, our five hours, we look at that at, on a more aggregate level. Just, we maintain it, but in order to report out, it's so comprehensive that we look at, we, we report out on an aggregate level in terms of what housing units need what, in okay. terms of meeting that five hours, so. Okay, so as you're reporting this, so you, you mentioned earlier a statement that you're not yet meeting the young adults, I think, were meeting their five-hour requirement, but perhaps the other other groups are not, or the adults are not. Can you share us what is the average amount of time today that an individual is receiving programming or being offered programming? Thank you, Chair. Great question. Um, without encompassing or incorporating uh, recreate, mandatory recreation, without incorporating volunteer hours, without incorporating education or other events. And, and as we kind of distance ourselves from the nucleus, it becomes what does that 45 minutes, what does that hour really mean in terms of the overall mission? But we're approximately th three hours short without encompassing some of those areas that could put, or religious services, which could potentially be utilized in terms of idle, the five hour idleness reduction. So you're at two hours today when you take those other top subjects out, average? Uh, approximately three hours. About three at least, okay. You're about approximately three hours, okay. And what is the timeline by, where you, by which you think you are at five hours offered, excluding those items? If, if we're not, if, and, why, and why are you, if I remember this law reading it, I, I, but I have to go back, it, it doesn't necessarily exclude those items, but you're tracking those differently, meaning recreation time or religious service or other 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 things you mentioned. Those could be you. Could, there's one world where those could be included in the five hours by I think the definition of the law, but you're but you're talking about with your program providers. That's correct. 
I'll put a caveat on what I say. Yeah. I would love for those other activities to be incorporated. Well, make with, your numbers the ill evaluated. No, with that said, Chair, we will continue to strive to bring as much engagement and programming as possible. That would put us over. So, but but you're but you have a <clears throat> there's a commitment from the mayor, and then there's a city council law that both speak to the five hour requirement. You're saying you're short of that today. If, so so what is the expected timeline to be at the five the mandatory five hours? Chair, I can or beyond I, it. I cannot give you a specific date in which that five hours will be met across the board. I can say that moving forward into the new fiscal year for and even for calendar year uh, 2019 that we're looking at our internal resources how we can better deploy our resources how we can look at the time in which um, internal and external staff stay on floor can we spread that out and then how we can utilize other resources to bring that back up you know bring that up to five hours to meet that five hours a as I said earlier I, I, it was acknowledged that the sheer scope of of all the housing units and there requires a lot of staff and how we can do that in a fiscally minded way and that's why we're looking at our internal staff of how we could utilize people different staff differently to at least have a broader reach do you have a number uh, a budget number associated with what would it take to get you up to five hours uh, not at this time but okay we can look at that yeah uh, I mean, I think you mentioned thirty-eight point million dollars. One million million dollars is your budget right now, so I would be interested to know how much you need in order to get up to the five-hour program. Um, and 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 so you're tracking. How are you determining that some of those three hours? You're just doing it through the spreadsheet. That's through internal providers, uh, internal staff, external providers, and areas in which we have that. Um, added recreation and that's by internal program recreational staff okay and then your how so okay um, and you're somehow tracking this through you're, you're taking all that data and incorporating it essentially into the spreadsheet to know and you're not you don't actually know then if an individual is receiving a five hours or not you like you're tracking by in the aggregate of all the jails, is that correct? Uh, no, sir. Okay. We do have that individual information, but we l report out at a, on an aggregate level because we're providing to the housing units. So, Be because of the changeover in the population, programming is done on a housing unit, right? For right. Religious okay. services, some other right. congregate services. So. We look at the housing units on where the gaps are. We could potentially have an individual that's in a housing unit that hypothetically is receiving five hours, but that individual, let's say because of court or what have you, oh, I gotcha, only I gotcha, received I gotcha. three hours. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's uh, from a from a logistical standpoint, w we're getting, we gather more information based on housing unit than individual. You, you're, you're saying aggregate meaning you're reporting the data based on what how each housing unit exactly. is receiving, got yes. it, versus an individual. Okay. Um, if I noticed that so different different uh, different jails and I and I guess in different housing units to receive different programming, or different so they get offered different programs and uh, there's ones I think some had financial literacy and some others didn't. How is it determined what a housing unit receives or a, or a jail? How is it determined what they receive? Who makes that determination and how often is that re, you know reevaluate to make sure it's meeting the intended goal? Our team looks at that on a regular basis in terms of what is deployed where. Um, if I can break up our programming into buckets, we have our cognitive restructuring uh, bucket, we have reentry, we have our hard skill development, we have education, we have workforce development. And so within those buckets are these modules that are contained within them. For instance, if you look at our uh, overarching reentry programs of the ICANN and SMART programs, within those two overarching programs that are provided by our external providers, uh, there's, there's a series of modules that are contained within that in terms of soft skill development, emotional um, regulation, self-awareness, what have you. And so um, in terms of, so 
we deploy our resources where we can because there's a finite amount of money that's available through those contracts with our external providers. What we'd like to do moving forward, we've had discussions about how can we be more prescriptive, more targeted with, with, with our programming in terms of looking at using those new admission units to do assessments, to do criminogenic risk, to see what their true needs are, and then how to roll that out within the model of housing units. So th there's ongoing discussions on how to be more prescriptive, how to be more targeted, and within that whole scope is a housing plan that we don't house based on criminogenic need, we base on classification, mm -hmm. custody level. So it's always a work in progress on how we could truly prescriptively meet the needs of an individual because of programming being provided on housing units. Um, on, on hard skill development, like OSHA, you mentioned earlier, just to follow up because you were talking about then the sort of housing, and th that's, you do that training, I, was pr I assume you don't do that training in your housing unit, you go, like I think we saw the carpenters doing a, an apprenticeship program or a program in, in one of the jails. So how do, you, how do you become eligible for a program like that and how do you get chosen for a program like that? So for OSHA 30, so what you saw there, Chair, was our young adult mission in terms of their uh, industry-related um, technical skill building. And so that is done on site. A lot of the soft, sk the hard skills in terms of an OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 can be done in a housing, or flagging can be done in a housing unit. Since it doesn't require tools, it's more manual based. So that's how that, that's facilitated. Got it, and, and same thing, it's by housing unit, so they come and they do that, you you opt in, whether you want to take a- By point. provider, and so if we, ha if we have an individual that's living in a housing unit that, for instance, does not have an ICANN program, that in individual can request to be transferred to a housing unit, and then that would be facilitated by that, by that facility management team. Got it, okay, you answer my next question. Um, I wanted to, I wanna give everybody an opportunity to speak, but I wanted to just go through one more, or one more, couple, just a couple more questions, and then uh, obviously get to all the folks who are here, and been, thank you for all your, all your patience. Um, new jail facilities, as we're in this conversation around the siting of four new borough-based facilities, um, it's, I believe they call for a larger amount of programming space. So can you tell us a little bit what you envision programming in the new facilities and what, that's sort of how you're gonna prioritize programming in these facilities versus what they receive today? It would be utopia, truly. This is my fourth facility in my career where generally speaking, jails or prisons are not built for the reasons of why they're there. And that is to provide the resources, the engagement, the programming in order to help somebody start that process to transform themselves and change their life. So the vision and the department is actively involved in uh, the construction and the vision of these new jails is we know the logistical challenges currently that we have of getting people to congregate areas in order to get programming and let's say to be as prescriptive as possible. There's alarms, there's medical appointments, what have you. So how much can be done at a housing unit while still fulfilling that need of, of being able to migrate to another area to just to move around? And so what I foresee is an area, uh, and the chief can, can weigh in in terms of uh, speaking as well for the department, where programming is done in a sound quality environment that's separate from those individuals that do not want to be engaged, that the lighting, the color, the overall infrastructure is conducive to somebody wanting to change their life. If you think about the, the process for an individual coming into one of our jails, it's, it's not conducive to transformation. It's, it's other things. And so that, that's, that's what I look to, of libraries off of every housing unit in order to be enriched by reading. And I'll let you. So if I can, I mean, besides the utopia, from the meetings that I've attended, the, the space is designed to inclusive of uh, medical providers and programming space, even when as um, described by the chair of restrictive units. So it reduces the logistical challenges of 
accessing programming because that space includes workspace for the providers so that you have desk and office space on site and then there's open uh, window uh, sunlight availability in the programming space and it's uh, the challenges that we have now in the housing areas are the barriers of sound and sight and other things that are happening. So the designs that I've uh, looked at so far meet those challenges and it provides the uh, individual and the provider a really different space to, to access learning. Okay, great, thank you for that. Thank you for that sort of explanation of how the new jails and sort of the intended program space. That's the designs, Chair, that's all I. It's that's all you get? Yeah, it's I, the designs. I understand, I understand, I understand. Um, uh, just the last few questions, and this is before we get to some of the folks who are working and doing this work. Um, one of the concerns we've heard from folks is that the volunteers have to attend, attend four training sessions, um, and that um, I think it's two regular sessions of PREA training, and then another session at Rikers, and have a, you know asked for consideration about. I know this came up the other day. Training to be shortened or condensed, or even made available online in some manner. Any feedback on whether that's possible? Uh, yes, sir. The uh, the training actually is much more involved than just the, the four reference. We have a number of uh, annual training mandates and biannual mandates uh, from the city, the state, or the federal. The um, Prison Rape Elimination Act training uh, is a um, biannual federal requirement, but sexual harassment prevention, workplace violence prevention, those sort of things are, are city-based. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, delivering the majority of them in person. Um, however, the commissioner's vision for training for the organization that extends beyond our members of service and into um, our volunteer ranks and the uh, personnel involved with Health and Hospitals Corporation and the, the service provider organization uh, is that we are beginning to invest in online modules. So we're transitioning PREA, the uh, requirement, the refresh requirement, to a self-paced online module. And it, actually, we just had a kickoff meeting uh, on that one yesterday. The, um, the uh, instructional design partners were in with our subject matter experts. I won't get into the details, but big picture, we're going to be transitioning a number of those modules to an online format so they can be taken remotely. Uh, there are a couple of onboarding uh, and initial engagement modules that really do need to be taken in person. I know our security awareness training has gotten a lot of attention lately because of some of the selections of the videos, um, but we've um, swapped out a number of the more harrowing uh, videos for some that are a bit more constructed, and we've worked with the training team to really en enhance the message there and in integrating some role plays in the coming weeks. But so I, I would just ask as a, re a request here to, and then maybe this is part of the, the meetings that you'll be setting up with the providers to consider some ways. We don't want to discount or reduce the quality of the training, so I understand why some of that needs to be taken. But it sounds like for some folks who have volunteers, it's, it's hard to recruit and keep people committed with onerous requirements around training sure. and ways to do it online or in maybe other locations. Um, I think would make it helpful. So I'd ask you to take a look at that and um, and and see if there's opportunities to uh, make that available in different ways or different. Similarly, they um I think one of the questions was around. Um, I think the trainings are offered Monday to Friday and not on weekends. And whether there was a, a, any opportunities to do weekends or you know off business hour uh, training. Absolutely, we provide training now on what we call multiple tours. You know, our primary tour is 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and um, 3 p.m. to 11. We provide training for in-house personnel literally around the clock based on the tours that we're working. Adopting a similar schedule for our volunteers and program partners is certainly feasible. Okay, so it sounds like you're doing that. You're saying you're doing that already? No, we're not doing it yet. I'm saying that we're, we, const we presently deliver training on multiple schedules, but as I dive into, I'm now partnering with um, my colleagues on the uh, volunteer and program provider training strategy, and we're certainly open to that. We're certainly open to WebEx, so that if it's offered at 7 o'clock at night, people can take it from home. Um, but yes, that's all open. It's all on the table. Okay. And um, one of the other things that came up, it sounds like you have now an email, e email portal, but 
just having a day-to-day -day contact to know who to call to sign up right. or uh, any sort of day-to-day -day issues, temporary clearances, are in, are, which are, I think, paper-based and maintained by fax, also have issues. And I think some just level of having uh, a point person, I think it sounds like you guys maybe made some commitment earlier about doing something like that, but, you know, how do we, well, who is the point of contact right now for providers and volunteers? We have two people that work in our volunteer, uh, volunteer program uh, for all 1,200 um, volunteers. And remember, it's important to know too that out of those 1,200, there's these annual refreshers that are consistently rolling out. And so it's, it's the great efforts of those two individuals, that point person, um, and she does a great job of reaching out to uh, various organizations, individuals, um, not only to schedule the orientation and the trainings, but also if more documentation is needed. Um, but that's that's what we have right now. It's it's two people. And, and but how does how does one find those two people? Is my I guess my my question. If I'm a volunteer and I have a temporary clearance, that's not that's not uh, it's lost or something. Like how do I who who do I go to? And that's what we're, that, as we move forward, that's what we're streamlining and, and uh, bringing more clarity to. Because after that initial um, touch is made of getting the application and then, and then furthering that along through uh, the clearance process, then it makes its way, that individual would make his or her way to the facility. And then it's, th so the oversight is moved from our volunteer division, now it goes to that facility. And just recently, over the last several months, we established facility leads in all of our facilities that who are that point person. So one of our endeavors moving forward is to have that card of contact for that individual, for them to contact in, in, in case that there's a problem with their clearance or if there is a uh, lack of access into a facility. So we're establishing that as that's an ongoing process for us. Okay, we'd love, we'd love to see um, them have a clearer sense of who uh, they should be communicating with. And that um, came out of that meeting, Chair, and, and so that was great. Okay, I appreciate it, thank you. Um, and just to sort of close it out here, the punitive segregation came up earlier in terms of the library, but are, if you are, is an individual in punitive segregation receiving any programming? Uh, through counseling, sir, through internal counseling mm -hmm. services. So that's in the housing that's unit, or where does that occur? Uh, cell side. So that would be one-on-one -on -one engagement with internal staff. Okay. And that's one area also, Chair, that we're looking at of how we can improve that, how we can have more meaningful, more engagement between counseling staff as well as those that are in punitive segregation. Time, stay, time there, the stays there, are relatively short compared to in general housing areas, but that doesn't negate the fact I'm a big believer in engagement in secured housing areas. My last five years of my career, have been about uh, improving programming through the delivery of programming and through a multitude of ways um, in restricted housing areas. And so that is one area that is on our radar to actively increase programming, the value of the programming, what's also being um, uh, provided. And just on that one point, Chair, a uh, really positive point, just over the last six months, we're looking at th that question focused on punitive seg. We've done great work for those that have not even made it to punitive seg yet for, for whatever infraction. So we've rolled out in three jails at this time um, offender in, uh, intervention strategies for those that not even just from a disciplinary standpoint, just from a uh, for those that are just not um, maintaining themselves well. Um, and we can find that out through um, the grievance process, what they're grieving. Um, just through informal information from non-uniform and uniform staff that someone's just not doing well, just not coping well, someone that has had a, a, a run of disciplinary actions. We're actively involving correctional staff with those individuals, working with them one-on-one -on -one to target those, those thinking patterns and those behaviors that are leading them um, into, a, into a negative space. And, over time, what we'll find is that that intervention strategy will slow down the pace of those going to a punitive segregation or another restricted housing area because of that meaningful engagement. I wanted to um, 
hand it over to Councilor Holden who has a follow-up question. I, I just was, I, so, so thank you for all this information and for your engagement and also willing to set up some new processes here for uh, engagement. Um, I will say, and, 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 and at some point in, with follow-up, we you know, certainly want to see that two or three hour number or whatever is the current provided number to be at the five hours. It's a requirement. It's a commitment we've made as a city. I understand there's things that are not included in that that one might include, but um, we are we are missing the mark in terms of hitting the five hours. Second, you know, I'm supportive, and if I can be, um, of something around improving tracking and technology throughout the jail system because it's, this is not the only place where we find the DOC just doesn't have and it's budgetary, it's a budgetary resource question, doesn't have the resources they need to be able to do the job and to, and to meet our basic requirements that we ask of you, but to be able to do things in a modern way and hopefully the new jails offer an opportunity for that. But, um, but even before that or in addition to that, um, we want to make sure you're, you're, you're resourced in ways to be able to do this stuff because I don't want to be back in a year and saying, why aren't you there? Why can't you track if it's a, a question of resources? Um, I have a couple of things I'd ask. One is um, the question about library services, programming, of course, as well, for punitive segregation. The library issue to me seems like so simple to be able to provide periodicals or books to people there, especially people who, are, who are, do, not get, do not get hours outside of their cell. Um, second is to distribute work group information and make sure we have a clear and everybody who is interested has a clear understanding of when those things are happening, how to access them. Um, three is some commitment to, to, to get that program menu. I mean, I didn't even talk about enough, really, the ability for people to know what the programming is, to know that I can go to another house or request another housing unit if there's something I want to take advantage of, but to have that as an available uh, as an available uh, something soon and 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 make it more available um, some com some 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 improvement around the training and the online training for folks who are working there um, off hours as well where it's possible and um, and then again a, a, a primary contact point for the groups uh, so I'm sure so many know how to re get get to the people you need to get to but because we've heard complaints about that, it sounds like an area where there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. Um, and, um, and then, you know, again, all, any way to, tr to track this in a better way. And, and, I, and I, before I hand it over, I will say, you, you do have a commitment here to try to make reporting easier and to make sure that we can get the information we want to do our oversight better, but that it's done in a way, in a format that does not create spreadsheets where we don't know why we don't have the data, no explanation, and it's a, it's an, maybe it was an, even an error on our point in bill drafting to get to that point. So you do have a commitment on that. I know we, 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 we ask for a lot of reporting, but it's, it's important information, particularly in this jail setting. I, 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 I believe that firmly. Um, I would ask, we'll do a follow-up with you guys on all those points, but I'd ask you to take those really seriously in our, uh, and then I'm, I presume at some point in the, in the, in the, in the future, we'll do a follow-up on this to see where we are in many of those items. Uh, with that being said, I want to hand it back over to yeah, Catherine. Uh, just a quick question on uh, uh, my own information about um, punitive segregation. You said something about counseling. How much counseling do they get, and is it mandatory uh, in punitive seg? Can they just say, I I'm not going? Uh, they can decline counseling services or social services if, if they like. But that does not stop our commitment to making our rounds, our slash, our tours through that area, engaging with individuals, asking them what their needs are, seeing what their interests are, and that counselor providing uh, materials for that individual. Uh, might there be an incentive for some counseling? Let's say if you agree to meet uh, with a counselor, we'll give you less time in punitive seg. I mean, that, that, that's an option. I would agree, um, sir, that it's an option, but we have to be considerate of the action that was adjudicated that contributed to your placement there and take that into account so that we could both meet the penalty of that adjudicated action but provide the service in a continuous basis and ensure the safety of staff and other individuals in that environment. So is it something that's possible to incentivize? Absolutely, but I just want to be mindful that we're not um, – 
engaging low-level offenses as, as we were in the past. So typically the population that are now in punitive seg are serious offenses. So it's no longer like, did you make your bed? It's an act of violence that perhaps may have contributed there. So we have to be considerate. And that would be a very individualized action. Right, but you can't give up. I mean, no, you can no, no. Because this person has been violent. Absolutely. Um, you and you also have to try to reach them. Otherwise, they get out and they do the same thing. And, and that's exactly the point that I was going to make. We absolutely want to engage them because they're not coming out of punitive seg into another environment. They're coming back to us. And they're going to be in general population, perhaps. So that would definitely be an individualized approach. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Thanks. I, sorry, I have two more questions. One was uh, from Councilman Richards, who did not have an opportunity to ask it, and the question was, if you did survey, are, are you, is, if in his, his bill, his question was, are, are there ways to ensure privacy for folks if they were doing a survey to make sure that there's no sort of backlash for uh, responding honestly? Absolutely. Um, surveys that I've been involved in in the past have been uh, anonymous. So it, it, it's not tied back to an individual, but uh, certainly I would say yes to that. Okay, and last question, just on the, in the data that you collect, does, and when you, the individual level data you do have, does that get shared with the Board of Corrections, the individual level data, or they get the same data we get, which is the, more of like the aggregate numbers? The focus uh, with our Board of Corrections um, oversight has been young adults, so due to that population, due to where they're housed, that's very small numbers compared to the right. overall scope of the population. So we do provide um, individualized, that granular level of uh, data. Of who and what they're getting. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And um, we will uh, follow up with you. But thank you for spending a couple hours with us here. And thank you to, to Council Member Holden and the others who had really fantastic questions. Um, we're now going to go to our panels. We have about an hour, uh, which I think is enough time for the folks that we have here. We'll have a time limit, but then we'll ask questions as well. So I think we're going to start with the, um, you guys are, you guys are all good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're going to start with the Brooklyn Public Library, the uh, Queens Library, and, uh, and that's it. Brooklyn Library and the Queens Library and the New York Public Library. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for being here and thank you for your patience as well. Um, so we will, we will continue. Um, uh, we're gonna ask just to do a, like a two minute uh, timeline, but then we'll have an opportunity to ask questions and follow up. I'm sorry to put you on a, a timeline, but I wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity to testify. Um, you could start left to right and um, just if you can state your name and uh, and then begin your testimony. And if you're affiliated with the same group, you're obviously, you can, you can testify as a group, and then we can do with follow-up questions. So, great. 
Thanks so much. And just your name before you start. Sure. My name is Neely Nuss, and I'm Correctional Services Librarian for Queens Library. My name is Diego Sandoval Hernandez. I'm Correctional Services for uh, Brooklyn Public Library. My name is Nick Higgins. I'm the Chief Librarian of Brooklyn Public Library. And my name is Emily Jacobson. I'm the Correctional Services Librarian for the New York Public Library. Okay. All right, so good afternoon. My name is Nick Higgins. I'm the Chief Librarian of the Brooklyn Public Library. Thank you, Chair Powers, uh, Council Member Drum, and the members of the Committee on Criminal Justice for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the uh, New York City's three public library systems on Intro 1184. For nearly 40 years, the city's three library systems have filled critical educational and recreational literacy gaps uh, to people, uh, for people incarcerated in DOC facilities by helping individuals develop and sustain a love of reading and a lifelong pursuit of knowledge. The libraries operate book lending services for people incarcerated in all NYC Department of Corrections jails, uh, employing various service models to best fit each facility and population, including mobile book carts, um, flexible standing libraries, and dedicated library spaces. In fiscal year 18, 31,000 incarcerated New Yorkers checked out over 68,000 books and magazines from our correctional libraries. Nearly 2,700 connections have been made between incarcerated New Yorkers and their families through our library-based video visit uh, program, and countless others have participated in monthly library-led English conversation groups, art and music programs, and early literacy classes. Through these efforts, are impressive, uh, though these efforts are impressive and reflect the hard work of, and commitment of our librarians and corrections partners, with the right support from City Council and the DOC, we could do so much more. The library's collective experience in running high quality libraries for people in DOC custody puts us in a unique position to inform the proposed legislation. And we're eager to contribute to discussing any plans on the expansion of library services. Providing um, access to books for everyone who is incarcerated in DOC jails is a goal that has driven our work from the beginning. And we hope our experience and expertise can be used to increase access to quality library services in meaningful, sustainable, and practicable ways creating new readers and supporting those who already love to read. The goals of the proposed legislation uh, align with uh, the promise of city's libraries to provide high quality and accessible and relevant services to all New Yorkers, but we do see that there are some, uh, some, some, some challenges for implementation, namely that there's no language within the proposed legislation uh, that requires library professionals to oversee those uh, library activities. In our professional judgment, any library services offered to the public, particularly a service offered to vulnerable populations, should be staffed by library professionals who are accountable for collection development, circulation management, and program facilitation reference. And the lengthy daily operation uh, schedule of the proposed library services would require a significant uh, investment in staffing and collections. And finally, within the legislation, there's no mention of consultation or guidance uh, from library professionals in building, designing, and facilitating uh, expanded library services, leaving the complex project presumably up to the Department of Corrections. Um, so as we've been doing for decades, the Brooklyn Public Library, New York Public Library, and Queens Library continue to be poised to provide expert guidance on best practices in collection development and maintenance, staffing, circulation practices, and educational and recreational programming uh, for an expanded library program within the Department of Corrections. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify today, and we're able, available to answer any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank we'll do all the right. testimony and then I'll and we'll follow up with some questions. So we'll go ahead. Oh, no, we're doing, doing a group. You're all doing a group. Is it? Yes. You guys are so good. Uh, we're good partners. Uh, yes. uh, so all, all these are all three. These are all three systems here, right? So um, all three of you are in different facilities, and so is that correct? Yes. So can you, just actually a quick who who's in what facility? Okay. I assume right, I can yeah, guess yeah. based um, on the geographic but but. but uh, sure, here's the, um, here's the list. So New York Public Libraries and Rose Singer, um, GRVC, EMTC, AMKC, and, uh, and MDC in Manhattan, um, Brooklyn Public Library, also in RNDC, the West Facility, OBCC, BKDC, uh, AMKC, VCBC, and uh, NIC facilities in Queens um, are in... Right. So how is that, how is that even decided? Got it. Just sort of the facilities we settled on. Okay, got it. And I know the Manhattan one, I had the opportunity to go to MDC with the, ex the opening of the new or renovated, I guess, room. I is, it, is it correct to say there's a, there's a physical library in every single facility 
No. No. And I see the head shaking. So who has a, which which facilities have a physical library and which ones have a it sounds like just like a cart a mobile cart uh, and and then second question is with the mobile cart how often is that provided to somebody? So at NYPL we have dedicated library spaces only at MDC and at Roseanne Singer Center. Um, at EMTC, we actually don't have a permanent library space. We set up every week in the gym there and then put our books in the closet when we're done. Um, at AMKC and GRVC, we go around with a book cart. Uh, at GRVC, that's weekly service, and at AMKC, it's bi-weekly. Mm -hmm. um, we only have a standing library at RMDC. Um, <coughs> there's no standing library at AMKC, and the legislature was, we've been working to try to open one for about this legislation would allow would be sort of like a formalization of the process of uh, provision of library services for uh, for people and um, an accountability on each institution whether it's the DOC or the or the libraries to provide that for people and what do you and how does one request if I want to go to so you have a an MDC you have a physical space there uh, I want to go and take advantage of that I want to go in they go actually go visit there and take a book out and spend some time there. How does that process happen? And second, outside of when a cart goes around, how do I, if I did want to request a new book, is there a process by which that happens? So um, I believe the way it works at MDC, although my colleagues are the ones who run that service, um, we, have, we have a schedule set up so that every housing unit has a different time that they're called to go down. And an uh, officer will go announce it on the unit and escort the guys down. We don't have folks sign up ahead of time who want to go. They can just decide spur of the moment. Um, and if, unfortunately, because this isn't a mandated service, if they do miss it for the week due to a conflict, they just miss it. Got it. And, with, and the, with, the, with the mobile cart that goes around, <coughs> how often? <coughs> Is it based on? So, so yeah, it depends on the facility. So like for example, I go to MKC twice a week, but at the same time, <coughs> there's still areas of general population we don't receive services. So there's still like areas that you know if we wanted to have access to the book, we would. They don't have either a physical space they can be exactly. taken to, or they don't get a, a mobile card, yeah. so they get nothing. <laughs> so if they wanted to uh, request a book, but had it. Let's, let's start running. Um, and uh, your and and to, to Councilmember Holden and, and Councilmember Drum's point about the punitive segregation, yeah. what would it take to provide a service to folks uh, if they want if they wanted to take advantage of your service but they were in punitive segregation? Right. So that that deserves some clarification, I think, from the libraries okay. because we do have a history of serving people who are in punitive segregation in the newly developed ESH um, um, uh, uh, facilities and also mental observation units within the facilities. But I can I can pass this over to folks. Um, sure. And for uh, the facilities that NYPL serves at um, GRVC and RMFC, we do actually exactly what you recommended. We have books that we do drop off and provide for the for for just that unit. Um, and at MDC, we actually go around with a book cart and serve the men who are in the F ESH unit. Can, can I ask something? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you would, but would you agree that possibly we can create a bookshelf in those cells um, where they would have books and you know they would keep them for a certain amount of time, but we'd provide just more than one? Because I, I don't know how the, the – so these carts go around to the individual cells in punitive seg? Is that how it works? Um, either we drop off books there that they can just use in the unit however they want, um, or, or we do go around with a cart. So, but the, you don't have contact with them, the, uh, the inmates. You, you, just, you just pass something through a, a slot? Is that? Um, in some places we do, and in some places we just yeah. drop off. Yeah. And is that true for you guys as well? Um, in some places we don't actually have contact with the person. We receive uh, a sheet that they fill out, and we try and okay. fill that request. So we never actually have any So you give them a sheet of the list of the books that you have? Um, genres. Okay, genre, yeah. all right. All right, it just seems that w nothing is standardized here. Uh, like some, you know, it's almost like you, <laughs> you hit, it's, it depends on where you end up. It's, a, it's sort of a luck of the draw. It, it needs, I think, because obviously if you want to, somebody wants to get out of their lifestyle or tra change their lives, 
books really are the answer, and we're not providing that, it sounds like. Um, the fact that the commissioner didn't know about punitive seg that you do provide in some you know, instances, uh, that maybe we should examine this and maybe we should have a bookshelf in every cell, whether it's punitive seg or anything else. I don't know what they can do with the books, you know, throw them. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think at this point um, we have to really make this a, you know, something that Danny Drum, the Councilman Drum was saying, and I was shocked that there's, you put somebody in punitive seg and many cells don't have books. They never, they don't have access to a book. You would think we should want them to have a book in their hands or at least uh, minimally uh, self-help books. I mean, come on, um, that they could grow or, or certainly uh, be entertained even. But anyway, um, I, I think we need to look at this and maybe through legislation um, address it. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Just um, if you can also give us a copy of your, if we don't have a testimony with your recommended changes for the bill as well, we'll take a look at them and we'll uh, come back to you guys with any questions that you may have about implementation or uh, or uh, ensuring that it's a public, it's a public, the public library is in that process. And it's similar to Councilor Holden's point, uh, you know, standardization and expansion, obviously a, an obvious goal here as well. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. your testimony. Thanks. So we are going to have now, uh, we have Elizabeth Williams from Bronx Defenders. We have Nancy Ginsburg from Lin Legal Aid, Danielle Gerard from Children's Rights, and is it Messiah Ramkasun from Friends of Island Academy. Okay, thank you. Um, you guys can start. We'll get you on the clock. Um, I usually go left to right, but whatever order makes most sense. And just if you can, before you start, just tell us your name and your affiliation. Thanks. Can you turn your mic around? Thanks. Hello? Yes? Yes. Yeah, you go. My name is Elizabeth Williams, and I'm a social worker in the criminal defense practice at the Bronx Defenders. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Good morning. I'm Messiah Ramkisun, uh, Friends of Island Academy, Director of Programming and Community Partnerships. I'm Danielle Girard. I'm Danielle Girard. I'm a staff attorney at Children's Rights, and I'm going to refer you to my written testimony for a background on our organizations work with children in foster care and juvenile justice systems. Great. Good afternoon, Nancy Ginsburg, Legal Aid. Great, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. The perspective I offer today uh, is informed by the experiences of our clients' engagement in programming while in the custody of the Department of Corrections. Uh, to the extent that our clients are incarcerated pretrial, we believe that DOC must provide services and support that are therapeutic rather than punitive and that maximize our clients' chances for a successful reentry. Ideally, voluntary participation in educational, vocational, and therapeutic programming would address underlying issues leading to our clients' criminal justice involvement, 
decrease the likelihood that they would be involved in violence and prepare them for future reentry. Sadly, DOC programming regularly fails to live up to this ideal. However, we are hopeful that a radical reorientation of the culture of corrections informed by the experience by those profoundly most affected is possible. The Bronx Defender supports the proposed bill to conduct an annual survey on conditions of confinement and treatment by correction officers. This survey is a critical first step towards addressing longstanding issues for our clients who are incarcerated pretrial. Every day, our clients and staff encounter barriers to accessing accurate information about program availability, programs abruptly end without explanation or notice, and the lack of communication within program staff and the dearth of information available to advocates limits our ability to support our clients' regular engagement in programming. And a majority of our clients find music and art programming to be very positive emotional outlets while they are in custody. However, this is not widely available. And we urge DOC to increase regular access to music and arts programming and increase those therapeutic outlets in all housing units. We further support proposed bill 1184 as regular access to books can provide similarly provide uh, therapeutic outlets for people in detention. And we have learned through our, these stakeholder meetings uh, that DOC programming is intended to be standardized uh, across all housing areas, but our clients uh, have contradicted that goal. While standard programming is generally available to our youngest clients, our older clients are facing more serious charges or have um, higher bail, often report no access to that programming. So it is my hope that this testimony will provide uh, support to providing broader oversight of and create changes to the Department of Corrections existing programming structure to one, increase transparency and centralized information about the availability of programming and to ensure that the DLC's goal of providing standard programming across housing units is accessible to all who are interested and to expand the variety of vocational, educational, and therapeutic programming to support our clients' successful reentry. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Same thing. We'll do that, everybody, and then I'll we'll follow up with some questions. Thanks. On behalf of Friends of Violent Academy, I thank the Committee on Criminal Justice for the opportunity to address you. My name is Messiah Ramkisun, as stated, and I serve as Director of Programs for and Community Partnerships at Friends of Violent Academy. Just to give you some backdrop, Friends is a nonprofit organization which was founded in 1990 on the school floor of Rikers Island. I want you to know a little bit about the comprehensive model of youth supports which we piloted at Rikers Island three years ago in collaboration with, with a rich array of youth-focused organizations citywide many of which are here today. Through the network, we meet kids within 48 hours of their admission to custody, Rikers and Horizon, and introduce ourselves as their friend's advocate. We reach out to their families, attorneys, and support systems while they're in custody, and use their time throughout custody to develop a caring, mentoring relationship. We leverage the relationships which we develop with them in custody to engage them post-release for as long as we can. Working with, working with them on their needs, goals, and aspirations. Working through their defense attorneys, we advocate in court on their behalf to minimize lengths of stay and further incarceration. We pick up sentenced young adults when they have completed their sentences on Rikers and drive them home with a plan to meet up and work on their goals. We deliver and facilitate programming on Rikers Island through partnerships with community-based youth-focused partners seven days per week in housing areas in custody. Collectively, these organizations offer enrichment such as art-based programming, cognitive behavioral supports, transformative mentoring through credible messengers, life skill supports, and legal support for the collateral consequences of arrest and conviction. My role in this is to identify, vet, support, and work with our partners. I know firsthand that their impact is unprecedented. We are privileged to have a unique and extraordinary set of 40 plus partnerships who provide workshops weekly within the housing areas at four facilities in Rikers. Together we seek to ensure that programming results in connections for youth post release at the neighborhood level. Right now the network provides 45 hours of workshop sessions per week. I'd like to fast forward just a little bit to address some of our concerns um, as to why we're mainly here as it relates to today's platform. Um, to make all of this work better and more cohesively, um, we offer the following recommendations to ensure effective delivery of programming. To address the huge backlog 
of clearances by expediting DOC's approval of volunteer ID applications, especially renewals. To extend renewal periods to 18 months instead of its current 12 months to minimize average wait length times for getting clearance. Facilitate the escorting process to better enable providers to get to housing areas. To build flexibility into the DOC ID approval process, which would allow access by providers who have prior justice system involvement and who are often the most impactful with youth. Um, you know, I, I know at one point it was either murder or rape um, or the conditions to which folks would be denied access onto Rikers, but we have a lot of folks who have, um, you know, former history in the criminal justice system who have been denied for unexplained reasons, and even civilian staff without history who's been taken anywhere from six to eight months to get called back for a fingerprint or for um, a renewal appointment to pick up their IDs. Um, also to invest in DOC's, availability, DOC's ability to hire staff to support these initiatives. Last but not least, to build in our existing infrastructure to facilitate post-release continuity with providers at the neighborhood level. I can't emphasize enough the value of this programming for young people, for their health and well-being, and for their future pathways, and incidentally, it allows for a less unhealthy jail system. Great, thank you. Uh, the Young Adult Plan commits the Department of Correction to providing all young adults in DOC custody with comprehensive, individualized, outcome-oriented jail and community-based services in safe environments that are conducive to learning. This should not be limited to the best performing youth and necessarily includes even the most challenging young adults. There are currently well over 600 young adults on Rikers. From the February 9, 2019 update to the Young Adult Plan, First, it is hard to determine how many young adults actually participate in programming at Rikers. The update maintains the department, quote, offers five hours of programming in the majority of general population housing areas, but the department concedes in another context that, quote, substantially all means, quote, no less than 50%. If a majority of the housing areas is similarly limited to no less than 50% of the housing areas, then a substantial number of young adults are not getting the programming they need. Second, it is not clear if 19 to 21 year olds have access to the same programming offered to 18 year olds or if there are enough programming slots available for every young adult who wants to participate. It seems that the most popular programs for young adults include CBT, life skills, and healthy relationships. Are enough of these classes available, or do young adults get placed on a waiting list? Furthermore, the February update provides no programming data specific to the 18-year-olds who are all housed at RNDC. Third, it is widely acknowledged that development continues through early adulthood, and providing age-appropriate programming ensures that this development continues. This developmental period is also a time of greater risk when a youth's environment can have substantial influence on decision-making. Research has shown that the window of opportunity to affect youth development and promote resilience closes in the mid-20s. The Young Adult Plan, as initially designed, provides an opportunity to align department rules with best practices in youth development. By doing so, older youth will be safer and less likely to re-enter detention after their release. We urge the City Council to remain engaged, to hold the Department accountable for providing continuous, dedicated programming for all young adults at Rikers, and to set specific benchmarks and timelines for meeting the programming requirements and other goals laid out in the Young Adult Plan. Otherwise, Children's Rights fears that the Department's continued requests to the Board of Correction for variances from the Board's minimum standards will constitute the actual implementation or lack thereof of the Young Adult Plan. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. The, we, have, we have submitted extensive written testimony and I'm not going to read it today. I'd like to respond to some of the things that the Department said. Um, for many years, we, Legal Aid has been uh, one of the main participants in a group of many um, who worked on adolescent, the adolescent reform process after the settlement of the Nunez case. Um, and while we have seen commitment from the top of the department, or at least from some of the top of the department, the ability to trickle down that commitment has been limited at best in many of the buildings. 
Um, I will say that you must hear the department's testimony through the lens of what actually happens on the island. Security controls every decision that is made. And the department relies on the people who make security decisions before any other division gets to make another decision. So programming only provides programming to those people that the security division deems eligible. And how those decisions are made are completely opaque. We have asked for many years, multiple times, for a map of who gets programming in which building and which housing unit, and we have never been allowed to see that. I do not, I have never been able to know which of our clients, depending on where they are housed, are able to access certain services. The other issue that is a critical issue is that kids and young adults and really adults also are moved from building to building like chess pieces. And so they start services and then they lose engagement with those services. And they, and that is probably why you never get completion rates because very, it is very hard to complete a program when you ping pong around the island. Now, I do not want you to underestimate the importance of what Messiah is talking about, developing caring relationships. You cannot underestimate the need set of many of the people who are currently on Rikers Island. It is a very different population than it was when those numbers were very high. We're seeing a lot of people with extreme trauma histories, with significant mental health histories that sometimes we have a lot of trouble having been identified. And there are many obstacles to individuals agreeing to engage in services. And providing them, while we support providing a written menu of services, when you have all of those issues, a written menu of services is not going to do the job. We need to commit, the department needs to commit to continuing relationships with the programming services that are on the ground that have those relationships with those individuals because sometimes it takes a very long time to convince individuals to overcome their fear of being on the island, to overcome all their anxiety of all of their issues around their pending cases, their separation from their families and their friends to engage in services. So I would, the, the other issue about measuring recidivism in reentry is that the council has to, we're encouraging the council to recommit to this kind of analysis because the individuals who are held on Rikers Island are come from a very small number of neighborhoods. And they're the same number of neighborhoods that feed the child protective system, that feed every other system in this neighborhood, in this city. And it is the same neighborhoods and the same map that we've been looking at for decades. And so if we want to make a meaningful commitment to re-entry and reducing recidivism, we have to improve services in those neighborhoods. And those relationships that our clients are forming with the program providers while they're on Rikers must continue into their neighborhoods. The difference between see some, seeing someone you know upon release, who you developed a relationship while you were incarcerated and not seeing that person, is the difference between re-engagement and not. And so I beg you <laughs> to spend a lot of time with the providers who are on the island really hearing the work that they are doing and what works and what doesn't because we have serious concerns that these outcome studies that are going to be provided by DOC are not going to capture that very important information. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great testimony. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask, a, I got a lot of questions, so I'm going to ask a number of them. Um, I wanted to start with, there was recommendations made by Friends of Island Academy, a whole host of them, which were really, I think, helpful and, and clear, very clear. Um, I just a back a lot of clearances by expediting DOC's approval of volunteer applications. How long does it, just anecdotally, you're not under oath, uh, how long does it take uh, normally for somebody to get an approval of a volunteer 
uh, application, including a renewal. Well, I'll give you some examples. We have staff um, who work for Friends of Island Academy who have been previously granted um, access and volunteer IDs and have now recommitted to the renewal process. It was taking them anywhere from four to six months to even just get a call back for renewal um, in terms of being fingerprinted. Uh, we uh, just, I want to say two days ago, I had a program partner, uh, one of our program providers, who stated that she submitted her application eight months ago and have yet to be contacted. So, you know, nine months, a year later, people may move on to other job sites, other, you know, career paths, and the same people who were once um, prioritized to be the most credible to do the work, you know, and by the time that they even get considered for a phone call uh, to come in to get fingerprinted, or may never be reached out to. So it's, no re it's really... Uh, no predictable time frame, especially as, as of like the last, I would say, year or so. And, and currently, it's two. It's it's one you have to do it every year. It's been a annual. renewal, and your 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 proposal here is to renew it. To, to I mean, due off. to their, um, you know, they've they've conveyed to us that they're understaffed. That it's only two people that's responsible for over twelve hundred applications that are sitting on a desk that have yet to even be touched or looked at. So, um, so we propose that maybe if you cut down the amount of annual renewals and maybe extend it to 18 months that may in some form or fashion uh, support the problem. And have you heard, heard any feedback from DOC on that? I mean, it seems reasonable. We haven't gotten any type of um, consensual agreements in terms of what the next steps forward would be. Everything is still pending. Okay, and facilitate the escorting process to better enable providers to get housing areas. It seems like they made some announcement here today that they were going to add staff in. Any, uh, the, I don't know if you, you had an opportunity to hear what they testified on but they made some commitment and commitments are just commitments until they're actually happening but around I think adding in more contact points and more staff so we'll follow up with them to get more details on that yeah I mean I think I think it's a few things when you speak about escorts um, a lot of the programs go to the housing areas because oftentimes you want to get young people out of the house take them to a classroom uh, maybe take them to the chapel maybe take them to the studio they have a studio a music studio now in army DC or to the gym Get them out of the house, the jail, you know, the housing area environment, and take them to a neutral space. But sometimes it may take um, the office anyway from an hour to an hour and a half to escort them to that space. So by the time they arrive, it's only about 15 minutes left for programming. Um, so oftentimes now the providers are going to the housing areas, which sometimes is not the most conducive space for engagement because of all the varying factors there, um, with the TVs and everything else happening. But you know, at least they get a chance to see the young people and meet them where they are. Yeah, thank so you. that's that's been one of the. So we'll challenges. take those back, and I think the even like some simple stuff like the eighteen month versus twelve months strikes yeah. me as something fairly. And I want to say with the, the reason. And yes, not. The, I'm sorry. And also with the escort, and it also affects the service providers and the youth advocacy staff who are going in there to do the work because by the time they get tra uh, transition to the young person to the housing area. You know, it may be an hour, two hours. Sometimes people wait for hours just for an escort. So this is, um, it also affects the staff. Okay, okay, great. Thank you for those recommendations. The, um, to uh, Ms. Gerard from Children's Rights, um, your second paragraph of the first one you read talked about uh, age-appropriate programming to all young adults, not just performing youth. Could you give us more information in terms of, uh, I, I, under, I, Getting under, I have not understand what you're what you're getting to. I think is that some folks are just not being uh, provided programming, offered programming based on their uh, behavior, or there's or their so, security. So, so there are two things at play here. One is that it seems that the programming is being offered, but largely to the highest performing young adults, the ones who are in the units that, as a whole, are performing better. That's the first part of it. The second part of it as best as we could tell from the February 2019 update, the data isn't presented in a way that allows you to determine how many kids, how many of the young adults are getting the programming. And the programming in the appendices, uh, which are quoted in my written testimony, are cited to in my written testimony, when you look at them, you can't tell uh, who's getting what programming and how it pans out over time. So. I think, as Ms. Ginsburg said, it's opaque. Can I jump in just quickly? Sure. I, the, the department had committed to a young adult plan, and then it seems that commitment has been seriously diluted over the years. And while recently they have indicated at BOC hearings and off the record 
that they are going to start moving the young adults into young adult housing. It does not appear that to be, to be the case right now. So young adults are all over the island, and if they are in a building where programming is not being provided, they don't have access to programming. The other issue is, is that it's not necessarily age appropriate programming. So if you're putting a 19-year-old with a 35-year-old, those two populations may need and want very different programming. And what we saw when the 16 and 17-year-olds were housed with the 18-year-old, at least on, in the school, when the 18-year-olds were with the younger kids, they went to school more often. And once the 18-year-olds were moved with adults, they didn't go to school because if you say to any 18-year-old, you have a choice of not going to school, they're probably gonna say no. And so some of it is the environment that the department creates to encourage individuals to engage. And I think, I thank you for that. I think that the, there, so, so I'm looking at the February uh, report and they have some information, I mean, I'm just, just, to, just to, to the point raised, the data we receive, it's for this, I mean, the data received in this report has number of sessions, total number of participants, available number of participants, what that rate is, and average per, right, per session, I guess. Um, and then a, and then a, uh, at the end of it, or sorry, yeah, at the end of it has a breakdown based on facility, but not housing, particular housing unit of, um, I guess it's participate number of classes offered, young adult average participants, participation rate, and then topics. Is there is a recommendation here to have a more granular understanding of which exact housing units are receiving uh, programming and what type of programming? Yes, exactly. That's definitely part of it. I mean, one of the things is that all of the 18-year-olds are now, they were at GMDC and now they're at RNDC, but the 19 to 21-year-olds are all over the place and it just, it's a very similar population. The 18-year-olds are governed by Nunez, but the, but the 19 to 21-year-olds need the same kind of attention and they're not getting it. And if the, I believe the DOC also has something they call Success House, which they refer to in the February update. There's no data about Success House, how many kids are in it. The department itself talks about how the young adults learn better when they're in a housing unit where everyone in the housing unit is going to school, and yet there's no plan for expanding that out. There are no benchmarks set for how this is going to happen. I mean, if they are, as Ms. Ginsburg said, diluting the young adult plan, and yet at the same time, they're talking about some of the things that should be expanded for the entire young adult population. There's a disconnect there, uh, that, and, and again, the data just isn't there. Got it, and uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, uh, the, the comment about um, providing the, the guide that they've, or the menu, I guess, that they're offering, I think you had made a, a comment that um, from Legal Aid that uh, they have to be doing much more here. Do you have re specific recommendations what they could be doing in addition to just distributing materials? It sounds like, I mean, I, having a person that has a sort of a connection and an ongoing connection, rec actual act, more active recruitment, but are there specific structural things you recommend to help, to help improve upon what they've offered here today? I mean, I think it's related to what Messiah is talking about. I think that the correctional staff has to be working alongside the programming staff. The correctional staff has to commit to the model of program provision, and that takes training and oversight, and there need to be uh, consequences for officers who don't. And that is a very difficult place for the department to get to. I don't know if you've read the Nunez reports, but imposing consequences for officers who don't do what they're supposed to do is not a strength of the department. So it seems that we have many, many programming staff on the island, and they know how to connect to these young people, and they have a very good idea of how to meet their needs. And the officers, particularly who are in the dedicated buildings and the dedicated housing, uh, uh, the dedicated housing units, should be working hand in hand with programming so that there aren't distractions, so that they are escorted. I mean, it's not really something you can't, it's hard to legislate human relationship. So 
it's hard for me to make a, a significant, like a recommendation as to that how that happens. But I will say that during those years of the adolescent reform, when we were working in RNDC, when those officers were particularly trained and they were they volunteered to work with that population, we saw the environment improve. Now it wasn't perfect, but it improved. And if the department committed to moving in that area in every building on the island, I think that we would see better engagement of, of all participants in programming. And I think that we would see more individuals who are incarcerated engage in that programming. Got it. Thank you. I have a lot more follow-up questions, so we should all shout at some at some point. I just recognize the clock, and I need to I need to give this room up at some point in the near future. So thank you. Really wonderful testimony, and thank you for those rec those very clear recommendations. And we'd love to have a follow-up conversation with all of you as well. Thank you. Um, our next panel, we have uh, Bina Ahmad from New York City Books Through Bars, Julia Davis Children's Defense Fund. Steffi uh, Jacques uh, from Youth Represent, I'm sorry if I'm bad with names, and Kelsey Divala from Brooklyn Defender Services. Hi. Okay. All right, thank you, and we're getting copies of your testimony right now, but if you can just, you can start just with your, uh, your name and your organization, and then you can go ahead and testify. Thank you, council members. My name is Bina Ahmed. I'm with New York City Books Through Bars. Um, would you like me to go ahead, or would you like the other panel? You can go. Sure. We'll take a panel. <laughs> New York City Books, this is an excerpt from my testimony that I submitted this morning. New York City Books Through Bars has been sending books to incarcerated people for over 20 years. How we work is simple. People who are incarcerated or their family members write letters to us with their requests, and we go on a scavenger hunt of sorts in our stock library to send books that meet the person's needs and desires. We're a collective of volunteers who come together to raise money only to cover the costs of postage and packing supplies that we use to send the books. We believe that political education is necessary for liberation and for the day when our society can be free of the scourge of prisons and jails. We receive countless letters from people behind bars who tell us of the impact of books on their lives. Books are not just a means of escape or entertainment, though that comfort is not insignificant to someone deprived of sunlight and human contact and isolation. People also tell us that books have been catalysts for personal transformation. Last year, Books Through Bars faced challenges when New York State docs rolled out a policy that restricted packages from families and other members of the public. Instead, those in prison would have to rely on a handful of costly private vendors to receive warm clothing, food items, and books. As we noted then, private industry is a poor substitute for a public library. While the private vendor approved by docs offered some Main Street market fiction, the selection for people of color, those who are LGBTQ, or those who do not speak English was wo woefully limited. As far as, public as far as political education, the vendor offered many Ayn Rand titles, including a box set, but nothing by Howard Zinn or Noam Chomsky. We were all tremendously relieved when the policy was suspended. Our sister organization in Pennsylvania recently warded off similar threats to their work by the Department of Corrections there. Against the backdrop of these recent endeavors by prison officials to curtail what people who are in prison may receive from the outside world, this bill is a step in the right direction in that it recognizes the importance of providing access to free books. We are glad that the bill includes a proviso that books will not be censored with the exception um, for those that contain instructions 
um, on the manufacture use of dangerous weapons or explosives. However, we, there is also a, a, a condition that um, materials that may compromise the safety and security of the facility is also an exception. This last exception can be used to bar political books from entering prisons, such as those discussing civil rights or critiquing the government. We hope the city council will be vigilant in making sure that books are not censored based on the belief that ideas are dangerous, particularly those that relate to liberation. We can't help but note that the bill does not appear to provide funding. We hope the city council will do more than provide um, empty shelf space. We hope that the staff will endeavor to locate quality books that open doors for people, such as dictionaries, GED books, math books, and history books. Our volunteers work actively to find that kind of material for the people who request them. We also want to um, point out that many of the people who are incarcerated um, are still pleading their innocence. So while books are, are for personal transformation, we echo the concerns that they also be therapeutic. We value their therapeutic nature. Thank you for taking in my, our full testimony is in the statement we submitted to you. That's just um, an excerpt to address some of the concerns raised. Great, thank you. And we'll go down and follow up. Hi, my name is Kelsey de Avila. I'm with Brooklyn Defender Services. And I just want to comment um, you know, more on like what really wasn't said from the department. Uh, in 2015, the, uh, the department and, the ma and Mayor de Blasio announced their 14 point plan to reduce violence in our city jails. And one of those points was to reduce idleness. And we know that when people have nothing to do and people are stressed out, uh, that's when violence increases. And so, in, and within their 14 point plan, they, they were going to increase programming to a, a minimum of five hours. And so I really appreciate you kind of saying that they're missing the mark and they are, the department is failing in their own goals and their own responsibilities and they're really failing the people in our jails. Um, and so, uh, and then kind of like going off of what was that legal aid has said about, um, you know, access and uh, one of them is, is that we're, we experience over and over is where our clients are part of a program, they are committed, they want to take part, they want to complete it and then they're moved. They're moved to another housing unit, another uh, facility, and then there's just no reason, there's no really rhyme or reason to why the move occurred. Uh, there's no, th and then for us to help advocate for that move, there's no real like action. We haven't really seen a positive response from the department. And, um, and I mean, and also like high classification. So people who are uh, either like SRG, a security risk group, group um, allegedly like gang affiliated by their own intelligence unit, which is also questionable. Um, and then also, um, yeah, for just high class in general, uh, they don't have equal access to programming just like anyone else in general population. And I, and I think that's important because people, they are fighting their cases, going to court, and they don't have the equal um, access opportunities just like anyone else should. Um, and then lastly, I want to point out, I really uh, thank the councilwoman for talking about ESH because something that's also not mentioned, <coughs> sorry, was that for level one in, in enhanced supervision housing, the uh, department uses the tool of, of mechanical restraints. And, uh, and in order to level out of that unit, they have to participate in programming. But to participate in programming, they have to be chained to a desk. Um, and then lastly about the cell side, about penis segregation. So that cell side, that could be minutes or even seconds where someone just kind of knocks on your door and says like, hey, you okay? And then like walks past that. Like that is not, meaningful, that is not therapeutic, um, it's a joke. Um, and lastly, I just want to talk about, you know, the program menu, like, that's great. Um, I think that should also be shared with the defenders so that we can coordinate uh, services and we can effectively advocate for people in court so we can get them out. Um, so thank you. I just wanted to give you an opportunity. You had a statement here about 1261, the bill, uh, about the survey. Can you share just your comments on that as well? Yeah, so as it's currently writ written, uh, DDS does not support the legislation. We think that there's, um, we, we like the idea and we think it's important to like really get, um, we need to hear from people inside about what their needs are. But the way it's written about uh, seeking um, information of how DOC is treating them, we think that that could be serious uh, rep repercussions or retaliation. Uh, we don't think that DOC should be involved in um, distributing or uh, collecting or even analyzing that data, I think that should be an, a non-DOC um, agency or person. Got it, the fear be of like retribution. Yeah. A and the department, I asked that question earlier, the department said they would be able to do it anonymously to protect information. You don't have confidence yeah, in that? Yeah, I mean, like, let's just look at other things around sexual assault or, I mean, like, like there are a number of issues where, um, you know, like, people who have high media cases are, you know, 
Like there's just no there's no secrets in jail, and I think that it's I rather have POC not involved. In. And do you have an agency that you would think we should be doing it? Um, not like off the top of my head, but I'm happy to like talk about it or look at um, what what other models there might be out there. Sure, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Steffi Jean Jacques, and I'm a staff attorney at Youth Represent. Uh, thank you to Chair Powers and the committee for allowing us the opportunity to testify. Um, our testimony and recommendations mirrors those that were previously spoken by Friends of Island Academy. We have been fortunate to partner with the city via the Friends of Island Academy Youth Reentry Network, and we've been able to provide comprehensive legal services to over 250 young people since the beginning of our partnership. Since 2016, um, we have supported youth with school suspensions, voluntary surrenders, bail and mitigation support, criminal record reviews, as well as family court, as well as criminal court representation. Legal services for incarcerated youth is imperative. Any time in jail can jeopardize housing, education, and employment opportunities. The stakes are set even higher when a young person becomes entangled in the justice system. Youth Represent helps young people move from crisis to, stabi to, to stability and from courtroom to community. Our legal work is only successful because we exist in the context of other critical services provided by youth-oriented program providers. They not only align with the department's programming goals, but also they specifically address the particular barriers that prevent justice-involved youth from achieving their own goals. For this reason, it is essential that the, that the department maintain continuity of the programming for both pro providers as well as in on the funding level. And for us to continue this incredible work, we need to faci facilitate access to programs and services for incarcerated youth on Rikers. Two areas of changes are required here. First, the movement between housing units for program staff. For as long as um, our staff has been at Rikers, our ability to connect with youth and access, and for the youth to access our services has been undermined by an unavailability of escorts. It can take anywhere for, from an hour to three hours for us to connect with an escort to get us to the next housing unit to provide our services. In the interest of ensuring that young people are able to fully engage in essential services, we recommend the implementation of a standard process and schedule for escorting program providers throughout housing units. This schedule should be posted and visible throughout all housing units and should be interrupted only by serious safety concerns. Second, the processing time for organizational staff and volunteers to gain clearance is far too long. And although we understand the concern that volunteers on Rikers should have formal clearance, the time it takes to gain such clearance hinders our ability to provide effective services. Me personally, it took me five months from my clearance application until my, the day of my volunteer, volunteer approval. To be clear, our objection here is not to the required screening, nor to the training demands, but to the fact that the, the substantial delay in processing acts as, a, as an additional barrier for both providers and youth on island. In conclusion, we hope our comments highlight how indispensable the Youth Reentry Network is for incarcerated youth. We are also eager to work with the department, as well as the committee, to help improve access to Rikers for program providers and access to programs for incarcerated youth. Hello, I'm Julia Davis with Children's Defense Fund, and uh, I just want to second all the things the advocates have said today. I'll refer to my written testimony, and I'll just highlight a couple of things I think uh, deserve our attention. The first is that when we're talking about young people on the island, we're talking about the 18 to 21s that are still there, and we're also talking about the youth at Horizon. The continuity of services is essential. It's essential from a developmental standpoint. It's an essential um, component of the success of the programs. So what we need to hear, I think from the department, and I think is unclear, is a commitment to those providers in an ongoing way at the level that they need in order to meet the needs of young people, and we need to have that clear to all the providers that are doing the work every day, and young people need to come to rely on it. So I'm very happy that you've brought attention to this and that I've heard such commitment about following up to ensure that happens. Um, I think it's also important to put this in some other context, which is 
when the city ended punitive segregation for young people, the second half of that promise was to engage young people in services that are intended to meet their needs. And so what we need to see is the realization of that, the continuity of that, and we need the department to confront the issues that we've heard today and that to some degree I think they've acknowledged, which is they have not created an environment where programming can be um, engaged, where young people can't access it. We've heard about the escort officer problems and we've also heard about the challenges with security trumping other issues um, and decision making around access to programming. I think it is uh, perilous to look at programming as independent from security and the conditions of confinement, right? We know that when young people can engage in programming, the environment is safer for young people and for the people that work in that facility. So we need to see those two threads of management of the facilities reflect that and that leadership really embrace that idea. I, with regard to the two pieces of, um, the two bills in front of the committee, we absolutely um, endorse both of them, but we we absolutely also um, echo the concerns about protecting people's um, anonymity and confidentiality and protecting them from any types of retribution for participating in this, but I think it is absolutely in a moment in time to really investigate the conditions and experiences of young people and indeed all people on the island. Thank you. Thank you, and I thank you for all, all the testimony. Um, and I'll note from uh, 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 a couple of your testimonies uh, here, but particularly uh, books not bar, books not bars. Uh, I think we had a sign-on letter from the council that I, myself, I think it was Councilmember Drum had done in support of your position last year at the docs that I think we, we sent out on the day that Governor Cuomo made the wise decision to rescind it. So sorry we couldn't be more helpful in that regard, but we certainly supported your position that we were opposed to the state's changing of those. And have you heard anything in terms of another any changes in policy since then? Uh, many thanks for that. We really um, appreciate the support. Books through that bars, by the books, way. Books yeah. through bars. Yeah. New York City, um, the New York City chapter. Um, we haven't heard anything directly. I do monitor the, the letters we receive from around the state and occasionally from different facilities we do hear of people receiving maybe two of the five books they requested and the other three it's mysterious why they didn't. Um, so I'm kind of keeping tabs on that and you know, as we will be in touch if we find any sort of patterns or trends that are worth looking into with more concern. We are grateful to note that some, I think it's um, Otisville, there are some um, where we've been, they, we've been mentioned in the orientation programs and that's very helpful for people to find out about our work. And so that's been, we've heard that mentioned in a couple of letters, so that that's been a positive step. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, for Book and Defender Services, you do, in your testimony, I don't know if you, you, met, you mentioned it, but uh, talking about communication with the defense bar <coughs> around availability of programs. Can you give us some, some, um, some thoughts on how that might, that might work and what sorts of information you might, might be sought for, in, for, for folks who are providing defense services? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, one of the issues that uh, Legal Aid even mentioned was that there's really no map of like, what's available in which housing unit and what facility. Um, but I know like, it has to exist somewhere, I would think, I would hope. Um, I would hope. I would hope. Uh, so, you know, if it's like a, you know, a monthly kind of calendar of these are the programs that are being offered um, and then in what facility so that we could better, you know, do, I could better do my job of advocating for either a transfer or working with the department. Um, and also, I mean, I think sometimes, you know, there's been a few scenarios, which I, I, it's gotten better, but I know where, um, you know, like program staff will, will speak to our client about, you know, um, that like, oh, this will be really helpful in court. Um, and we agree, like, it's important to, uh, for any, like, criminal and family uh, defense proceedings. Um, the thing is, like, when, uh, you know, we don't always know, like, when that person might be working that program or completing that program, we can get copies of certificates. So it's just a, a just better communication in general. But in terms of just the department, like, I mean, a monthly calendar of what's available would be helpful. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Got it. And, and um, one follow-up question, too. DOC, your con this is written... DOC restricts programming as a punitive measure limiting access for some of the people who would likely benefit most. Can you talk to us about the use of programming as a punitive measure or the lack of programming as a punitive measure? Yeah, this um, is referring more about people who are uh, listed as SRG, uh, security risk group. So I gave an example, and this, um, this is more about around CHS, uh, correctional health. Uh, they offer a program, a road not taken, for people um, who have substance use uh, needs and uh, you know, we, 
when we advocate with CHS, if we can um, you know, have somebody part of that program, which includes like group work and, and, and talk therapy, um, we'll get a response from CHS saying we can't, uh, that person's not eligible because of DOC's classification status. And so in that classification, for in that example I gave you was because they were security risk group and they were alleged gang member, um, which this person has denied it over and over and there's just no real way, uh, no like clear path of appealing it in such a short time frame is what we need when you know people are uh, you know, constantly working on their case and they have a next court date next week and like how do we kind of work with, with the court and DOC to kind of get that moving quickly. Um, <coughs> where in the example I gave that um, the judge was okay with the program and was like willing to take it, but then um, when DOC wouldn't allow the move and we couldn't appeal the SRG status in time, uh, it was too late. Got it. And, and your view here is the type of programming that one is receiving, obviously to re rehabilitation or, and, and helping for reentry, but also helpful to presenting, as you're defending the person, presenting to the judge that there is uh, some sort of treatment going on that might be helpful to the particular needs of the person that's receiving it? Yeah, totally. I mean, it also, I mean, shows that the person is interested and willing and wants to engage. And when the person is telling you, like, they want to do things to help themselves and then to just be denied that. And yeah. and this is for anybody, I guess, really. <clears throat> the As we look at some of the stats that are reported to us and to the BOC, there's varying participation rates, and we, uh, U.S. have identified a whole host of reasons why one might, it might be available, one may not be able to take advantage, avail themselves of the program. And some, I imagine, would just be, you know, some are just personal. People just don't feel like it's helpful or don't perceive it to be, or don't just simply don't want to take advantage of a program that's occurring in their housing unit because it's, I mean, it's essentially supposed to be mandatory for offered, but not mandatory to participate. And so have you heard from folks reasons why, I, so I assume we can come up with some quick list easily, but bar reasons why one may not want to participate in a program in their housing unit? Um, so I'll just say, uh, kind of give, you know, two, I guess a couple examples of what I, we've heard from our clients who, um, you know, that when we uh, said earlier by the council about these soft programs, and, um, and a lot of time it's like worksheets. Like people don't really want to do a worksheet. Um, and I don't blame them. Um, you know, another one was, um, was actually not that long ago where we met with someone and uh, like in the afternoon and they were, um, uh, we asked them, you know, what was like, what were you doing earlier? And they were in programs and they said, well, we, uh, you know, we were just kind of doing some worksheets and then we were writing jokes. Um, so it's not meaningful. It's, um, it's kind of, it's become like busy work. Um, and I think people, for some people, it's just, um, you know, they don't view it as something that's like really helping them. So why take part in something when I can just be on my bed and read a book or something? So um, I think that's, that's a lot of things that we hear that it's just not meaningful or conducive to like maybe what their needs are and the, um, whether it's fine their case or like really what their, what their, what their goals are. Thanks. Um, I want to just be respectful of time here. So thank you all for your for your testimony. I know we will have some follow ups. And as someone noted, we usually do so do follow up after this with some of the things that have been raised by us and then by raise yourself to clarify questions and to um, try to get some commitments made about timelines and and processes and things like that. And so as always, we'll be doing that as well and incorporating some of your feedback into that. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I think this is our last panel. So thank you everybody for your patience here. Uh, we have uh, Darren Brown from the Osborne Association. I think we have somebody from the Sylvia Rivera Law Project who may be in an overflow. Oh, they're all here now. And, uh, and then the Columbia University Justice and Education Program.
thank you. Thank you for your, your patience. Um, same, same as always, uh, if you can just introduce yourself and then we can start with your testimony as well. And I'll have you two minutes to do questions after that. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nick Kincaid. I'm with the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. Um, so we are, to our knowledge, the only uh, trans, gender nonconforming, intersex-led, and specialist organization currently doing programming in uh, the Department of Corrections. Um, obviously, it's been said many times today, but programs really matter. They make such a difference. Um, and in particular, because 85% of the folks who are in uh, our city's custody system are detainees, it's so much more important to just recognize that their life should not be disrupted simply because of an issue of bail. Um, so attached to the testimony that I gave are some of the essays and poems and artwork that's been produced by the women who have been in the classes I teach, um, which I think is just sort of an example of like why culturally specific programming matters. Um, uh, and our program is unique in being taught uh, by transgender and non-conforming people for transgender and non-conforming people. Um, when folks are in the program, and as a, uh, the testimony from the Friends of the Island Academy said, when there is an ongoing uh, connection past programming towards the community, people actually feel very invested in coming home and feel very hopeful and optimistic about the idea that there is something worth working towards. Um, there are some concerns that we have, such as individuals in intensive mental health units are not granted access to non-mental health programs. So vocational, educational, arts, and other kinds of programming do not come into the units for intensive mental health. Likewise, at this point in time, people have to choose between going into the transgender housing unit and choosing between going to those intensive mental health units or going to an intensive drug and alcohol treatment program because those units where you live within the program itself um, aren't at this point in time um, accessible to transgender identified people. Um, or they are, but you, you have to go with your sex assigned at birth as opposed to the gender you actually live and identify with. So oftentimes women in the programs that I teach have to choose between being at Rose and not having drug and alcohol treatment or mental health treatment or going to a men's facility and having those treatments. Um, this means that they often are making decisions about whether or not to live free from sexual violence. Um, I wanna echo what was said about escorts. When, I was, when my program was at the Manhattan Detention, Detention Center, I would often wait between one and four hours for my escort officer. At times, the officer at the desk would just tell me, you need to wait until this escort officer's shift has ended as he doesn't escort people. And then it would tell me, just wait until the next shift and then that escort officer will take you there. Um, so this also meant that sometimes I would be in the unit um, when all the women would be locked in their cells for count or they would all be out to recreation or medical or they would all be having their dinner. And so doing my program was very hard because sometimes they would all be in their cells or they'd all be out of the unit. Um, I want to say that that's not been my experience since going to Rose, but I think that Rose has significantly more program resources than any of the other jails. And that should be, that should be replicated everywhere else. There's no reason, programs are so important. Um, I want to echo about the screening process. It's incredibly unclear. I've been doing this program since 2015. I only got my volunteer pass in January. Um, it took me that long to get my volunteer pass. <laughs> um, when we were doing voter registration this fall, uh, we were informed that no volunteers could have any kind of criminal involvement. Just criminal involvement. Does that mean arrest? Does that mean violations? Does that mean actual criminal charges? Completely unclear. Um, on the official volunteer website, it says that one must successfully complete a background investigation, but it doesn't say what they're looking for. Um, if the criteria is unclear, then you can't challenge it. Um, the mandatory security training that we all have to go through every year, in addition to that just being a very delayed process, is deeply troubling. Um, the one that I just went through in December was entirely videos of people on the streets or in the subways um, and being attacked and then the trainer asking us what should this person have been done differently so they wouldn't be attacked. It's unclear how that is helpful in any way to know the jail context. Or, yeah. or even to know, you know, where is my program happening? What is the setup of the room? That's not, that's not covered. Um, and in particular, one of these videos featured a, a transgender woman yelling at someone on a subway and in response to this video, an audience member, who is a volunteer, offered the incredibly harmful commentary that the first thing to be aware of is that's a man. So this reifies and perpetuates the idea that transgender and gender nonconforming people are suspect or suspicious because of our gender identities. And as someone who specifically serves this population in the jail, it was incredibly upsetting to be in that room and to have no one from DOC say, actually, that's against our policies, that's against city law, and that is disrespectful to anyone who you are working with. Um, so there was no intervention around that. The trainer just moved onward. 
And I also just want to close by saying there's some additional things that volunteers are told. They're told that if we know anyone in any capacity in the program, we must tell the officers so that that person can be removed from the program. Um, that also means repeat individuals who are receiving your services. Um, you also are supposed to keep an arm's length distance from every detained individual at all times. Um, th this is very upsetting because there's, there's nothing inherently wrong in knowing a person who is incarcerated. There's nothing wrong in having a relationship with someone who is incarcerated. Um, obviously, if you have some kind of romantic relationship, I understand disclosing that, but simply being like, this is the person who lives on my street, I know them, and I'm invested in them coming home to me whole, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to have a pr uh, program with that person. And I just want to close by saying, so recently, in one of my classes, one of the women was broken down in tears because she was talking about how none of her family members will answer the phone when she calls because they won't speak to her because she's transgender. And she was crying and she was talking about how alone she was and how isolated and that right now she feels very hopeless and she feels like there's no reason to even return her defender's calls because what is the point of anything? And in that moment, what I should have done is apparently maintained an arm length distance and said, you know, whatever I could from that distance. But obviously the human thing to do is to like ask her if I could squeeze her hand and then ask her, can I give you a hug? And that kind of consensual and appropriate touch actually makes a huge difference and it's I think the department needs to look at their entire training to not sort of reify this idea that there are uh, the service providers and there are people who are receiving services and there's no overlap. Thank you. Great, thank you. <coughs> um, just, on, we'll move on, but um, one is on the, the issue around choosing which union you have to be in and then potentially not receiving services. We should have a follow-up conversation where that seems completely unacceptable. Um, second, on the um, issues around uh, uh, I mean, we've, we've, we've long talked about delays in terms of getting the volunteer uh, IDs and stuff like that also completely, I mean, just unacceptable it would be that long. But, but on, the, um, and on the issue around the sort of emotional support to be able to provide, obviously there has to be some flexibility here that it's, if, it's, if it's appropriate and reasonable that there's some, you know, that, that we're, not, we're not being sort of uh, inhumane in the way we are viewing and, and providing services here. <laughs> um, and I have also actually in an account in, in, in one of the visits to the jails witnessed somebody using wrong pronouns and things like that. We we co corrected the person, but um, you know it, it's 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 just it's a, it's it's a, it's the, the treatment of, of of somebody. We are not even providing the respect to call them by how you know by the, the gender by the gender identify um, is is also unacceptable here. So. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with you on the other issues around the housing and, and, and it's particularly around programming as well um, to make sure that's reflected in our in our comments and our reply. Um, but I, you know I think at some point there's probably a separate hearing to be done, particularly around some of those issues as well. So we'll look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm going to just take ad excerpts from uh, my testimony. Sure. Uh, my name is Darren Brown. I'm the senior director, uh, senior program director of the Osborne Association's ICANN program. Uh, ICANN is funded by the Department of Corrections, provides jail day services, including discharge planning and post release reentry services in the community. Uh, we provide curricula based groups and discharge planning to men and women in 32 housing uh, units. Uh, 32 housing areas every day, totaling about 80 hours of uh, jail day services per day across six jails, at one time nine jails, uh, reaching upward of 4,000 uh, people per year. Uh, we provide a wide range of therapeutic, educational, employment, uh, readiness, and hard skills training services inside jails and case management, job placement, and housing referrals in the community, along with uh, jails and jobs, which we just acquired. Um, the Osborne Association has been providing service in jails for more than 25 years, starting with our Fresh Start Culinary Training Program, which is still currently running, although we lost one of the program sites, um, uh, as well as uh, our ABLE program before ICANN uh, for adolescents and the RIDE and ICANN reentry programs. We are very experienced with programming in jails, uh, having worked under many commissioners, wardens, and deputy wardens uh, in every single jail and through starts and stops of countless initiatives. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss the two issues concerning uh, the committee today, access to books and reading materials for people held in our city jails and the proposal 
annual survey of people in Department of Corrections custody regarding quality of life and conditions inside. We will also briefly address processing and training of new DOC volunteers, uh, which is the status of all non-DOC program staff. Uh, first, regarding easy and regular access to books and reading material, we support CM Drum's proposal. Um, I can't even begin to think about what it would mean not to be having access to a book. Um, and there should be, it should not be a privilege. Um, it's a fundamental right, I think, and an opportunity for the individual to grow through a process. Countless times in, in our experience, we've seen that. Uh, receiving books, magazines, and newspapers is a value and a valuable resource for people in jail, sometimes long after part uh, participants uh, get them. Reading can provide a, a productive way to pass time in jail, avoid fights, and behavioral problems, as well as aiding people to improve their literacy and prepare for returning home. Um, we should not be including books as a privilege to be earned or to be taken away as a punishment. As far as uh, jail-based libraries are concerned, uh, we would surely create more universal access to reading materials than uh, current policies, uh, which requires the uh, only new paperback books sent directly from vendors. Um, the cost for a participant to actually pay for a book, uh, given their circumstances, situation, and family dynamics, um, kind of diminishes the opportunity for reading material. Um, regarding the survey, of people detained and incarcerated in city jails, we support this proposal of CM Richards uh, and strongly suggest that it be managed entirely by the Board of Corrections, um, an unbiased independent entity. Any survey must be implemented carefully and with thought thoughtfulness regarding, re uh, regarding uh, respondents' rights to privacy, anonymity, uh, and freedom from reprisal from their feedback. Uh, while the city in advance advances the plan to close Rikers Island and moves towards a borough-based jail model, feedback from those held in jails can help the city simultaneously keep vigilant focus on improving the current conditions as possible. Regarding voluntary process and training for work inside, we acknowledge the demands in this area having rapidly increased, uh, possible, possibly outpacing the DOC capacity. Um, two people, um, handling uh, uh, DOC IDs uh, for 1,200 uh, volunteers is inconceivable. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not only a process where you're talking about new uh, DOC ID applications, but you're talking about the revolving applications as well. I might add that also you have to consider the DOC facility IDs, which also um, um, is another time frame that uh, you know causes us to have even further problems. I'm a senior director with uh, programs just about in every jail, and I don't have access to every jail. I have to be escorted. Uh, we so in, in our in our stance, we believe that uh, you know to add DOC staff to that process would be helpful. And truthfully, 18 months is still not long enough to hold a DOC ID. If you take a script from DOCCS, uh, the volunteer ID card uh, is a volunteer ID card that's issued to you until you're no longer a volunteer, uh, a volunteer provider in DOCCS. Um, that concludes my statement. Thank you. Thanks for the great comments. My name is Mia Ryder. I work with the Justice and Education Initiative at Columbia University. Um, I'm going to skip my prepared <laughs> remarks because people have covered just about everything. But I just want to echo a few points in particular. Um, the clearance for the volunteers. Uh, they were unclear when they gave their, their testimony about it being Monday through Friday. It's actually uh, the first training is either Monday morning or Wednesday morning. And the second training is only offered on Monday afternoon. So there's really... Um, I had two volunteers who went out there for their training. When they got there, it was canceled. They went out the next week again. It was canceled again. And I, I wrote to my contact. I said, they missed class twice in a row. They can't miss another class. So um, yeah, there's some problems with how that's organized. Um, the question of having the programs in the housing units or in a program's classroom, um, it's a real 
I, I would like it always to be a possibility to have a program in a classroom. Just the program operates better when it's in a classroom. You know, we're not having, as somebody said, with the televisions and all these distractions and the guards coming in and frisking people and it's just like, it's crazy sometimes what we're trying to pretend like we're having a class in this environment. On the other hand, it is true that it allows people to join us who need a little more time to get comfortable with the idea of joining a program. So um, that kind of cuts both ways, but really some of the facilities, there is no possibility of having a, a program in a classroom. And that's not, um, that's just not uh, achieving the goals. Um, and again, somebody mentioned the tension between the security and the programming staff. That's very real. Um, the programming staff that I have worked with are really remarkable and I commend them very highly and I value their wisdom and their guidance. Um, and, and there are some secure, like individual officers who are fabulous and who are very supportive of us. But there is definitely pressure from somewhere within the security to um, limit the access of programs. And sometimes it feels like to discourage um, programs from coming. Um, and it is very important to developing caring relationships with the uh, people. As somebody said, these are people who have experienced a lot of trauma. And um, for us to go in there and as the security training would suggest not to smile at people, uh, never to use their first names, not to tell them anything about ourselves, like as if that somebody knows that I live in Manhattan is gonna put me at risk, um, is just, it's not realistic. Again, it's not achieving the goals of um, why we're there. So I do develop caring relationships with my students and when I'm lucky they get in touch with me through my office phone number when they get out and we continue to offer support for them to achieve their educational goals. Um, Yes, and so th those are the main points I wanted to cover. Thank you. And I, just a question we, we, we asked to the department, but I had not uh, guess yet it really asked to any of the panelists after. With the, with the new jail facilities that are being discussed, what, else, what opportunities do those offer for better programming, uh, high, better, higher quality or more programming? I don't know if you're finely tuned into the plans, but what, what opportunities do you see that? Because I think in addition to the physical structures that are being discussed, I think, you know, obviously there should be a discussion around a set of principles for those as well, which would include high, high quality programming. And wondering if you see opportunities in that process. I'm on one of the subcommittees regarding officer training, uh, which is, to me, a, a milestone in itself, a, a provider that's on a, a committee that's about officer training. Um, and one of the things, the things that we're talking about in that subcommittee is about uh, cross-training. Uh, we're talking about uh, sensitivity training, uh, understanding some officers don't even understand why you don't walk into a, a, a group and yell out, it's time for this or it's time for that. Um, you know, I understand that, you know, when, it, you know when, especially when you look at a D officer that's on a unit, uh, a unit um, is probably one of the most difficult places to actually run a group. Um, um, and you can't really call it a group because of the way it's environmentally set up um, and the distractions. Um, but at one point in ICANN, we had uh, ICANN officers dedicated just to uh, ICANN. When that happened, um, the, the camaraderie, the work, the collaboration changed. But um, oftentimes facilities, uh, especially uh, uh, uniform staff, uh, uh, the ones that make the decision, captains, uh, will pull those officers for other reasons. And it's usually cited as safety, for safety reasons. Uh, but I think dedicated officers and uh, the training that we're doing now in pre preparation for the transition uh, is something that um, you know is, is important and should be done. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we we communicate with our civilian counterparts from DOC, but have no contact with uh, uniform staff. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Appreciate that. <coughs> and um, the same question I asked somebody earlier, which was 
that like just sort of barriers to participation. There's some real barriers in terms of the structural constraints, whether it's they're, they're, they're being offered or not being offered or other other considerations that might prevent somebody from taking advantage of. Then also the, the um, lack of participation because making sure they're getting the right programming or something they want to take advantage of. Any recommendations around how to increase participation in, in programs that are being offered? From the obviously from either side, from the pro the provider or from the department. I think it's a twofold. Um, one is uh, um, collaborating in a better way, communicating in a better way. We've had some success with that with ICANN, both Fortune and uh, Osborne. Um, the meetings that we've set up over time, over the time that I've been there, in in having that type of uh, communication and transparency. Um, yes, the unit is a distraction, um, but uh, DOC hired experts to, to run curriculum and uh, do evidence-based practices, uh, but yet we have to get all curriculum approved. Um, there are some other curriculums that uh, work very well, uh, some cutting-edge stuff. Uh, um, even a group therapy session, which uh, for them they'd rather see curriculum. Group therapy is not curriculum, but it's an opportunity to talk about what you're going through right now, um, or storytelling. Um, these are different uh, types of curriculum that are being used right now in the community that uh, are hard to get approved uh, through DOC. How long, what is the process for getting your curriculum approved? <laughs> that process, uh, first you have to, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of times what we do is we'll, we'll contract out and actually purchase a curriculum, a uh, curriculum that we tested in the community or looked at and figured that this was a good fit. Um, that process, um, once you do that, you're talking about a six month process. From DOC to review it and then say right. it's acceptable to be used. And, so. right. and then depending on the size of your staff, then you have to train your staff on the curriculum. Uh, and then um, implementing it means going through a calendar process to put it on calendars in all the facilities. So it could take anywhere from six to maybe eight months once you get approval. Got it. Yeah. I just want to add to that. I mean, my curriculum has never been vetted. So it's, there's obviously a difference as well in just in terms of whose programs get vetted and whose don't. The only thing I had to promise is I would not inform anyone of what their rights in the jail were, which I just to emphasize that I couldn't tell people what their rights in the city jails right, were. Right, 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 right. How absurd that is! But I had to just why is that? I don't know. Th no explanation given. There was no explanation. I just had to promise that wasn't going to be a topic of one of my of my classes. Um, so obviously, there's also a difference. No one has asked me ever to see a curriculum. Um, Nobody's ever asked to see my curriculum. I usually send like a short paragraph because I figure the less I say, the better. Got it. And I, I'm sorry, asking. I know Osborne has a contract with Department of Corrections. Are you contracted, or you're volunteer, or volunteer? volunteer. Okay, got it. So maybe is there maybe there's a difference based on status. I don't. Uh, I can kind of answer that. Um, the, a lot of the Strive uh, programs are, are different contracts from uh, both Fortune and, and I can Osborne. So the, the criteria is different. But then also, this is many years of uh, working with DOC and you know, throwing out suggestions. And sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, if you are consistent with it, sometimes you get some stuff changed. That's what I mean about the collaboration efforts. Um, and it needs to be on a facility level as well. And can I just ask a, for, for the two volunteer organizations, how often are you providing programming and where are you doing it? Well, I, I think you're going to kind of teach you. But um, like, how did you get, what was the, how, how difficult was the process to become an organization to provide services? And then how often are you there? And how, how does it get determined maybe for Columbia where, where you end up in terms of doing programming? So I started out at Rosie's. Um, I started out with one short workshop and then kind of it continued. So it was very organic, I guess you could say. And uh, that was three years ago. And now we go, I have volunteers going and I go most times with them. So Wednesday evenings, Saturday afternoons. Uh, at Rosie's, we're also now uh, on Saturday afternoons at RNDC. Uh, we have a temporary, like uh, a shorter program that's going on at OBCC, 
and we're offering a college class at EMTC. And who chooses that schedule? You know, there are various program coordinators, and I just kind of network, you know, like I email so-and-so, and I say, hey, I have this program, do you have room for me? And they say, no, but I'll put you in touch with so-and-so. And, and they say, Wednesday night, we need we have a need for some programming. Yeah, and they, they'll say, and they, we would love to have your program, you know, and then we work out the schedule. And, and we'll wear, too? Yeah, it's up to them, really. I mean, we're, we'll provide program to whoever we can get to. And okay. I could provide more if I could get my volunteers badged. I think it's, that's very similar. We also sort of had an organic process where I think after the Transgender Housing Unit was formed, um, Faye Lardy from the Prison Rape Elimination Act's uh, office reached out to us to provide programming. And I think maybe because it didn't come through programming is part of why it took about four years to get a volunteer clearance. Um, and so that happened, and then, and it was supposed to be twice a month. I think one of the, to also answer the question about like why people aren't necessarily participating is because I couldn't actually guarantee that I'd be there twice a month because sometimes I'd be asked to wait three to four hours and if I had another court appearance or if I had a client waiting for me or if I was tired, <laughs> um, I couldn't actually be there to do the next class and so folks didn't really wait on me because they didn't think I was dependable um, and they were correct. Uh, and then, so for instance, like I, I started to do certificates at the end of every single class because I can't do a multi-series class because I can't guarantee that I will actually be there to do the second one. Um, and also because since, as someone else said uh, earlier, people ping pong around all the time, folks are leaving the trans housing unit constantly. Um, I can't actually guarantee that they will be there for the second class either. Um, so, and so I think that's a big issue in people engaging in programming is that it doesn't feel dependable and it doesn't feel um, reliable. Uh, yeah. Are you all I asked to take attendance at each session? Yes. It, it gets taken twice. One, uh, the, the students sign in for the, the CO's attendance, and then we're asked to take another attendance and uh, email that to the program's coordinator afterwards. Gotcha, great. Thank you for that testimony, um, and I think you're the last panel, but thank yeah. you for, for staying with us. Uh, I'll turn my mic off. Uh, I wanted to say thank you for everybody. I know it's been a, it's been a few hours here. Um, I think that this commitment that the city has made, the mayor has made, and the council has passed laws around is really, really, really important. And we've met so many different groups that are doing work in here, but have all been raising very similar concerns. And a lot of them just became basic access to it, to it getting clearances, knowing where to go, who to talk to, and having a reliable structure that allows you to provide meaningful and consistent programming in there. Um, I think for us as a council, also having clarity, I think there was a number of testimonies that talked about just getting specific housing unit data so we can see what's being, what's being effective here and understanding, you know, even getting better data that, that's already required to know completion rates. Yeah. The fact that we don't have participation and completion rates in programs that are mandated to be reported on. I'm, we're happy to fix those issues with them in terms of what barriers to reporting might exist, but certainly when we create requirements, we, we have expectations that the basic data is being given to us so we can do a better job, the BOC can do a better job, you as advocates can un better understand where there's a need. And certainly our goal here is to expand programming in the amount of hours that are offered, two to three hours as when it's supposed to be five, un completely unacceptable. And, um, and the just the uh, options and availability of meaningful programming and making sure people are getting to it. And that's all to get to the, the sort of I think shared mandate of having five hours of really high quality programming that will help people um, uh, re-enter back into uh, the city and be able to you know take advantage of whether it's re-entry services or emotional services or, uh, or, or, or being ready for a new job. Um, this is all meant to both reduce idle time but really to meet certain particular goals. And I think this hearing demonstrates we still have a long way to go in order to do that. And I think every single group talked about access, like volunteer clearances. That seems like some, some easy stuff immediately with the department that we should be looking to fix. But the long-term goal here, and not that long-term goal, is to really make sure that our five-hour mandate is being met and that um, we're getting um, 
you know, clear and reliable data in terms of our ability to hold those accountable. So I do envision we'll be back here sometime in the future talking about this again and getting a, a clear update. In the meantime, I think our, our role here is to incorporate a lot of the feedback that was given to you and the questions that you were able to answer to give a formal response back and then start to move, look at the pieces where um, maybe even the, the, the 12 to 18 month extension of the review. That seems to me another one that's just like right in front of us staring at us as potentially something we can resolve. So um, please follow up with us if you have any additional points or questions. I know the two minutes is difficult for everybody to get into all their ideas. We have a lot of testimony to read through as well. Um, and I thank you all for taking time. First of all, thank you all for the programming you're providing and being, and being very caring about um, uh, providing the service that you do to be here today um, to do this. And um, we, will, we will have specific questions and we'll follow up with groups, but also if you have you know, follow-up information, we also look forward to seeing that and you can submit additional uh, testimony as well. So thank you for that. Uh, and with that, we are uh, adjourned here. Again, I want to thank all the staff uh, for putting this together. Thanks.